Coming up next, we take you to Capitol Hill for coverage of a hearing conducted by members of the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance. Congressman Edward Markey, a Massachusetts Democrat, and his colleagues hear the views of Commerce Secretary Robert Mosbacher and representatives from the Motorola Corporation and American Electronics, the focus of the hearing telecommunications developments in Eastern Europe. Good morning. <clears throat> Last fall, the Berlin Wall came crashing down, but an invisible and no less sturdy wall still remains standing. That wall prevents the people of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union from freely and openly communicating with one another. As Americans, we know better than any other society on Earth about the power of communication. It is the cornerstone of our value system that free and open communications among people is the best guarantee of democracy. Communications is also the lifeblood of a modern free market economy. Ironically, the old Stalinist regimes that once ruled throughout Eastern Europe recognized these same fundamental truths. For 40 years, these governments systematically walled off their people from getting access to modern telecommunications systems in order to maintain centralized political and economic controls. As a result, Eastern Europe now emerges from behind the Iron Curtain with the most backward, antiquated telecommunications infrastructure in the developed world. The Soviet Union is not in much better shape. While the United States has about 90 phone lines per 100 people, and the Western European average is about 60 lines, Eastern Europe averages only nine phones for every 100 people. Of course, access to plain old telephone service is only uh, part of the story. In today's global marketplace, telecommunications has become vital to economic uh, successful development. Without fax machines, data communications, private networks, 800 services, credit card calling, and other telecommunications services, Eastern Europe cannot successfully manage the transition from communism to free market economies. For example, they will be unable to build modern financial service industries or efficient manufacturing enterprises without the telecommunications infrastructure needed to do business. Access to such technologies may also be critical if the Soviet Union is to make the same transition. With so much needed in the way of telecommunications infrastructure modernization, the opportunities for the American telecommunications industry to do business in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union are enormous. At the same time, the obstacles to doing business are daunting. Many of these countries have little access to convertible currencies. Many lack the basic technical and managerial expertise to run sophisticated telecommunications enterprises in a market economy. All of them have laws restricting foreign investment. We know Western European firms are moving aggressively into the emerging Eastern European telecommunications market. They have the natural advantage of geographical proximity and cultural affinity. In addition, they have the political advantage of government backing, backed financing and generally more liberalized attitudes towards export controls. We can't change geography, but we can take other steps, such as arranging for financing, technical assistance, managerial training, and relaxing export controls so that U.S. firms can compete in these new markets. Today's hearing represents what I expect will be the first in a series focusing on what specific steps should be taken by the public and private sectors in this country in order to maximize America's ability to compete in providing telecommunications products and services to the Eastern European and Soviet markets. We will be seeking to determine whether existing U.S. government initiatives to provide telecommunications training, advice, expertise, and financing are adequate. We will also be focusing attention on what U.S. industry can do to bring its resources and expertise to bear in meeting the telecommunications needs in this part of the world. The subcommittee is pleased to welcome Secretary of Commerce Mossbacher to today's hearing. Secretary Mossbacher has taken a leadership role in focusing attention within the administration on the importance of building a modern telecommunications infrastructure in Eastern Europe. 
to facilitate economic development and nurture democratic political institutions. The subcommittee is looking forward to hearing from him about the telecommunications needs of this region and what the Commerce Department is doing to respond to these needs. We are also fortunate to have a distinguished panel of experts here today who can address the market opportunities which are opening in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, export controls on telecommunications products and technologies, and what government and the private sector need to do in order to maximize our ability to successfully compete for business in these countries. We thank all for their participation this morning, and we look forward to their testimony. Uh, that concludes the opening statement by the Chair. Now I'll turn to recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from the state of New Jersey, Mr. Rinaldo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, commend you for holding, holding this hearing, and I certainly want to join you in welcome, welcoming uh, Secretary Mossbacker here this morning and thank him for testifying. He has always cooperated with this subcommittee to the maximum <coughs> extent possible in the year that he's been here, and uh, we're pleased to have you here again this morning. There is probably no greater economic and foreign policy issue now before us than the emergence of the democratic governments in Eastern Europe. Over the last year, almost every month, we witnessed one more autocratic society opening its doors to freedom and democracy. Given the, given the magnitude of the political reforms, the speed with which they took place is astonishing. Unfortunately, economic reforms, which will be the underpinning for long-term political stability, are coming at a far slower pace. When those reforms do come, I hope the United States will be in a position to play a positive and significant role. I understand that Chairman Markey has drafted a thoughtful piece of legislation, and I think that legislation, once it's introduced, deserves very close and sympathetic consideration. I know that some have argued that the private sector alone should be left to this challenge. They point out, for example, that the Bell operating companies have already begun to invest in Eastern Europe and that the United States now has a $2.6 billion trade surplus in programming. Certainly these are positive achievements and I don't discount them. But I also don't think it benefits the United States to ignore an opportunity of truly historic proportions. In my district in New Jersey, I represent thousands of cons constituents whose ancestors came from Eastern Europe and who still take a very personal interest in the events in Poland, East Germany, and other countries. They want the United States to do all that it can do to ensure the success of democracy in those countries. Moreover, the opportunity that we're speaking about is not just political. United States business people are constantly claiming that we need to promote exports and become more competitive internationally. The State Department Task Force, headed by Ambassador Diana Lady Dugan, has outlined one approach, and Congressman Markey has adopted that approach in his draft. It may not be perfect, but it's certainly a very constructive start. For those who oppose it, I hope they're prepared to offer alternatives or constructive suggestions. And for those who support it, I hope they will suggest ways to make it even stronger. Mr. Chairman, I again want to commend you for your leadership on this issue. Welcome Secretary Mossbacker and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman very much. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership in this important area. The events of the past year in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union have indeed been dramatic because of COCOM export restrictions over the years, uh, we have been fairly successful in keeping critical technologies from entering the Soviet Union and the bloc countries. To a very large extent, COCOM restrictions have put a big dent in Soviet bloc acquisition of critical technologies. Can you imagine the flood of high technology over the years to the communist world were it not for American leadership on this issue. COCOM restrictions were one very big incentive to cause the Soviet Union to liberalize and to embark on a, a program of democratization. 
course, uh, the COCOM controls have not been totally successful in keeping restricted technology out of the Soviet Union. As Toshiba was able to sell uh, important machinery to the Soviets in 1987 in spite of controls. Today we examine COCOM restrictions on telecommunications equipment. There is fear that if we don't help Poland build a modern telecommunications system or other countries like Poland, the West Germans or the Japanese will. There is evidence that restrictions on American companies' ability to export this type of equipment is very costly. Costly to our manufacturing industries and manufacturing jobs. In a time when our trade deficit is so high and we're still a world leader in manufacturing large, sophisticated telephone equipment, it's important to look at the possible advantages that could accrue to our telephone and telecommunications manufacturing companies by loosening the COCOM restrictions. Loosening the COCOM restrictions would also allow joint projects. The U.S.-West project to place fiber optic cable across the USSR, if approved, is typical of the type of joint projects we may see in the future. It's ironic that U.S.-West is prevented by law from providing cable TV service in Denver, but they may soon be able to do so in Irkutsk. However, I would like to hear from our witnesses from both sides of this question as to the impact of such a fiber crossing the length and breadth of the Soviet Union while political uncertainty still reigns and while we know very well how authorities over the years have abused telecommunications against, uh, to use them uh, against the interests of their people. The administration has proposed to bring to COCOM a revised export control list focused truly on strategic items. That seems to be a good balance and one which will help strengthen the COCOM process, which I believe still has meaning and would like to hear from Secretary Mossbacher uh, on that particular issue. We should try to strike a balance between sustaining the health of our telecommunications manufacturing enterprises and our world trade position. Uh, in critical technologies such as advanced telecom equipment. And we need to ensure that our national security is not compromised. As Yogi Berra said, it, it ain't over till it's over, and there is substantial political instability along the length and breadth of the Soviet Union today. But the pace of change in Eastern Europe is exhilarating. Only months ago, the Eastern Bloc nations were under communist rule, and we might add that Soviet troops still occupy Eastern Europe. So uh, given the uncertainty, particularly in the USSR, uh, we need to be certain that liberalization and democratization in the USSR are irreversible, and we should be cautious about sweeping liberalization of our high-tech export policies at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I too would like to welcome uh, Secretary Mosbacher here for uh, this important uh, hearing. I had an opportunity to glance at an article in uh, Broadcasting Magazine uh, where the uh, uh, interview was, took place between Ambassador uh, Diana Lady Dugan and the Broadcasting uh, Magazine, and uh, having just returned uh, from um, several countries in Eastern Europe, uh, she, uh, she was in Budapest, uh, Prague, Bucharest, and East Berlin. And it was uh, interesting uh, what she had to say. And uh, particularly, I know that the Secretary has been uh, over there as well, and it'll be interesting to see uh, whether his uh, views coincide uh, with hers. But uh, she uh, goes on to say in this interview, um, we heard a lot of, quote, where are the Americans, end quote, in both broadcasting and telecom. And although a lot of Americans have gone over uh, on uh, trade delegations and viewed the sites, relatively few deals have been made. The West Germans are all over the place, uh, which I guess perhaps is to be expected uh, because of the proximity. But uh, I think that uh, certainly the, uh, the challenge is uh, very real uh, to uh, Americans uh, in that uh, market. Uh, and I'm also interested uh, in hearing from the Secretary in regard to uh, what uh, many perceive as a huge pent-up demand uh, for uh, our uh, ability to deliver services uh, in the telecommunications uh, field uh, to Eastern Europe. Uh, I suspect that probably the definition or the quintessential pent-up demand uh, 
uh, would be represented by Eastern Europe for over 40 years, uh, they essentially have been unable to uh, and perhaps not even uh, aware of uh, some of the uh, services and goods that uh, could be available to them. And all of a sudden we see this ex hugely expanding uh, market. And if, obviously if we take in Europe 92 and add Eastern Europe in, you've got the largest market in the world, larger than the American and the Japanese markets combined. Uh, and so it does present huge opportunities for us. Uh, but it will be interesting also to understand how uh, the history of uh, state involvement in broadcasting in all the telecommunications fields uh, can be uh, reconciled uh, with uh, our uh, history of free and open uh, telecommunications uh, policies. And so I do look forward uh, to the Secretary and to our other witnesses uh, to uh, detail uh, some of those challenges and also some of the uh, pitfalls that may very well uh, get in our way in the short and the long term. And I thank the Chair. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there any other members seeking recognition for the purpose of making an opening statement? The Chair does not uh, note any other members seeking recognition at this time, so we'll turn to uh, our uh, first witness, um, who is the distinguished Secretary of Commerce, and he uh, is uh, once again gracing our uh, subcommittee with his uh, presence, and we welcome you. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pleasure to have this opportunity to provide you with my views on the crucial issue of telecommunications in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. I have a formal statement which I have inserted in the record. I would like to make a few preliminary observations. <coughs> if I could, uh, we will, without objection, that, insert his formal statement into the record at this point. And if, uh, if I could ask you, maybe put that microphone down a little bit lower. You can push it down. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the aftermath of the events transforming Eastern Europe, the region's leaders are examining how their infrastructures can respond <coughs> to the new political and economic order. As a result of these changes, we are re-examining and, where necessary, adjusting our public sector and private sector institutions to retool for today and tomorrow. Your hearing today is certainly an important step in the process. Mr. Chairman, open communication is an essential element in a free and democratic society. I believe our department plays a vital role in the process, both in terms of hands-on technological know-how and in a more strategic <coughs> capacity. The Department of Commerce has important resources to fulfill that role. The list is just a few. The National Telecommunication Information Administration, the Bureau of Export Administration, and the International Trade Administration, each adapting its services to meet the emerging needs of U.S. businesses as they enter into the Eastern European market. We are working closely with other governmental departments to support and advise the President of our innovative efforts to respond to these new challenges. As a matter of months, we have made, in a relatively short time, some solid progress. The administration has concluded, first, a business and economic agreement with Poland. Two, the XM Bank has begun, begun medium-term loans and credit insurance for projects in Poland. And three, as recently as last weekend, the President has proposed a program to export our political experience in making democracy work, which he has called Citizens for Democracy Corps. For last November, on my second trip to Poland, we were able to conclude an agreement outlining steps for joint telecommunication cooperation th through which we will provide training and technical assistance. In five, the administration has undertaken an extensive review of our export control regulations on telecommunications equipment, computers, and machine tools. This has culminated in the President's announcement that he will recommend 
substantial changes to COCOM. In addition, there are a myriad other Commerce Department activities. We are responding to the U.S. telecommunications industry's accelerating demand for precise information on emerging markets in Eastern Europe, and we are conducting or cooperating in numerous market analysis. I'd like to assure you that commerce is sensitive that besides the opportunities, there are problems either created or exacerbated by the political upheavals in Eastern Europe. As a member of the Helsinki Commission to Chairman, you share our awareness of the complexities of trade, environmental, and human rights concerned concerns involved in the dissolution of the East Bloc. As the President has noted recently, the Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe must have an expanded and a crucial role to play in the coming months and years. Acting on that conviction, I have ele elevated the Commerce Department Commissioner to the CSCE to a new position of Senior Advisor to the Secretary. And surely, telecommunications falls squarely within that portfolio of essential elements in an Eastern European revitalization plan. This concludes my preliminary statements, and I look forward to trying to answer your questions. Thank you, Let me begin first by recognizing the uh, ranking minority member, the uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo, for a round of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> And I want to once again thank the Secretary for his testimony. When is uh, COCOM scheduled to consider the administration's proposals on liber liberalization of export guidelines? Could you give us some time frame? Yes. Uh, this meeting is scheduled in Paris on June 7th. So really uh, just uh, a little over two weeks. Well, I think you'll agree with me that there appears to be more than ample opportunity for American companies in Eastern Europe. That seems to be a given. Many of our companies in this country already are taking advantage of that opportunity. For example, AT&T wants to sell a $7 million international gateway switch to Poland. Belcor may be engaged in revitalizing Poland's network management. U.S. Sprint is uh, joint venturing with the Soviets to build a $6 million data communication system. In your, the testimony you submitted, you talk about the World Bank <coughs> developing uh, telecom loans for telecom equipment. Uh, and as you know, a public-private corporation for communications in Eastern Europe, CCEE, has been proposed. First of all, what do you think of that idea? Well, I think uh, it's absolutely essential that we be a part of the revitalization of Eastern Europe from two standpoints. One, uh, because it helps, and not necessarily in any one order, but it helps U.S. companies, it helps our exports, and it helps our presence in Eastern Europe. Two, it helps these emerging democracies uh, get up to market speed and join the Western family of nations uh, with market-oriented societies as and democracies. Well, if American companies are chomping at the bit to sell telecommunications <coughs> equipment to Eastern Europe, as it's obvious they are, and there's, I think, plenty of empirical data to back up that statement, even if you concede that our efforts may need coordination, why should we need to dedicate more public money at a time when American dollars are so scarce and we're faced with a budget uh, deficit, a summit, and all kinds of uh, budgetary problems? Well, in the short term, uh, as you know, these currencies in Eastern Europe have, have not been and are not today convertible. They're moving in that direction. World Bank uh, is helping in that. And uh, uh, I think with a jump start, both by our government and governments all over the world, and ours being a relatively small percentage of the total, that uh, we can get the private sector in this country and the private sector in Eastern Europe working together. Because long term, 
that's how these countries will become part of the family of nations, and that's how we'll do business. But right now, they don't have the money in Eastern Europe to pay for these, these services, and that's why it works together. Well, what I'm uh, trying to figure out is, in light of the administration's uh, proposed action to liberalize CONCOM guidelines, first of all, <clears throat> first of all is the proposed CCEE necessary, and secondly, do existing executive branch agencies now have the ability to do everything that uh, we're talking about right now? Are you talking about another corporation, another government corporation, or quasi-government corporation? Is that what you mean? Right, to say? exactly. Yeah, I don't, uh, excuse me, I misunderstood what you were, what you were asking about. Uh, I don't see any need for that either. What I, what I was responding to is the, uh, uh, the need to uh, help the private sector get started, not through any additional government corporation, but just through uh, expediting what we already have. We have sufficient uh, infrastructure in this country, in this government, right now to get the job done. We don't need anything additional. Well, are you saying then that we don't need CCEE? That's correct. That's okay, thank you. I have no further questions, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair will recognize himself for uh, a round of questions. Um, Mr. Secretary, the United States is easing COCOM restrictions on exports to the Soviet Union, endorsing Soviet observer status in the GATT, and preparing to provide most favored nation trade status for Soviet imports into this country. There are some who believe that we should not be taking those steps because of the situation in Lithuania and other Baltic states. How do you feel about linking most favored nation status, GATT membership, or easing of COCOM restrictions for the Soviets to the situation in Lithuania? Um, don't you agree that drawing the Soviets into the world economy might be the most desirable way and the most effective way of ensuring that we see a continuation of reforms within that country? Yes, uh, I certainly do, Mr. Chairman. What, uh, what we see is uh, the President's uh, quiet diplomacy uh, appearing to make some real progress uh, with the Soviets and, and the, we hope with the Lithuanian situation. Uh, I don't want to embarrass the Chairman, but in endorsing uh, what you say, I might even quote from an earlier comment you made, which is very much in line, is that uh, and the best solution for us to adopt is the one which the Bush administration has wisely pursued, which is just that. Uh, and that was at your opening statement of the Helsinki Commission hearing on Lithuania on May 3rd. So let me say we totally agree and another aspect as far as the COCOM uh, changes, this really is a long-term effort that has to do with our export controls, with our allies, our COCOM allies, and Eastern Europe as well as the USSR. And when people try and link what happens in Lithuania to that, uh, they're attempting to turn on and on a on and off a light switch that uh, has to be a constant in order to uh, keep COCOM viable and keep uh, uh, some measure of uh, continuity. Now, one of the difficulties that American businesses have right now in viewing economic opportunities um, behind the uh, uh, Eastern um, European and uh, Soviet uh, markets is <clears throat> the question of um, currency convertibility and the repatriation of profits. Um, could you flesh out for us uh, what some of the benefits might be if we did grant uh, the Soviets most favored nation uh, status and reducing tariffs on products that they're seeking to export into the United States? Wouldn't that facilitate 
our ability to be able to sell things to them, uh, such as telecommunications products? Well, if I may, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll answer that on two levels. Uh, one, as you know, uh, the, under the Jackson-Bannock Bill, the most favored nation is, is, of course, tied to their immigration immigration bill. And uh, uh, therefore, their re the reduction of tariffs in a general way uh, under most favored nations will, of course, be tied to that. On a different level, as far as telecommunications and and very uh, uh, sophisticated telecommunication sales, we have not, nor do we, recommend raising the level of telecommunications sales to the same level at this point as we are to Eastern Europe. We believe in differentiation on those two, and we believe in it for many reasons. Okay. Um, the administration uh, proposes to relax the controls for several telecommunications products to the level now accessible to the People's Republic of China, the so-called PRC Green, Land, Green Line, the People's Republic of China Green Line. As you look beyond the priority sector proposal the administration has made on telecommunications export controls, do you see any such areas where we might be able to go beyond the green line, uh, such as uh, common channel signaling, uh, network management, or more sophisticated digital switches? Well, again, separating out at this point Eastern Europe from the Soviet Union, we are talking right now about going a little above the China green line with Eastern Europe, uh, 156 megabits versus 140 megabit level for the China Green Line. Uh, and as in all these things, we must remember we are still dealing above these lines on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, there has been no change on the level of megabit. <coughs> it's the same uh, across the board, the 45 megabit is our standard, all subject to a case-by-case -case review. Okay. Now, can you deal with the points which are being raised by some, and perhaps they're different um, countries, and, and you might want to distinguish between them, but the case which is being made by some that there ought to be a full decontrol of the export of these technologies in order to uh, enhance the drive towards democracy and help their uh, economies uh, move uh, more fully towards uh, a different economic uh, system. Can you deal with it as uh, a subject that uh, um, uh, that you can dissect into various uh, countries, if you want, or categories? Uh, but just deal with this full decontrol issue, uh, if you could, uh, first in terms of perhaps Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and then move on through uh, out uh, that whole region so that we can get some sense of where the administration, where you personally stand on the issue. Yes, well, I think uh, it's premature to even think seriously about total decontrol. Uh, so I think at this point I would, at this particular point in time, I'd be absolutely against that. Okay. I am for uh, a higher level of telecommunication going to Eastern Europe generally and specifically to those countries that will <coughs> give us assurances of safeguards that they will use these items for civilian use only and not transship them and that they will allow us to come in and inspect and verify that they are using them in that fashion. So with those uh, two caveats, uh, we believe in going to a higher level than we would with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, uh, first of all, as I said earlier, not only has not uh, gone through the steps to get uh, MFN, but certainly has not offered to let us come in and, at this point and verify and, and guard. So, and on a very uh, realistic basis, they are the only nation, although we have high hopes for them, that have the capability to be a serious military threat. So we're not recommending that they, they get the same level. 
Let me just, if I may, add one other thing, and that is that uh, at this point, uh, we don't think that uh, uh, we should be looking at uh, uh, the Soviet Union on a level of uh, decontrol that approaches these others until we see the other other things fall into place. Okay. Um, at this time, my time has expired. There's a roll call on the floor. Mr. Cooper of Tennessee has uh, returned from the roll call. What I'd like to do is uh, ask him now to take over the chair. Well, I'll try to scoot over to the floor and, and uh, make the roll call so that we can continue the hearing without interruption. The gentleman from Tennessee. This one. I appreciate the uh, honor you're paying the subcommittee by being here today, Secretary Mossbacker, and I'd like to try to follow on my colleague's questions. Not having heard all his questions, I'm somewhat handicapped in that pursuit, but let me see if I can get in the same line of thinking. Uh, as I understand it, um, there's concern about deregulating telecommunication products only not other products so no, that we actually have just been talking telecommunications Mr. Cooper. Mm -hmm. that, uh, as you know we we're concerned about all products we have uh, particularly focused on telecommunications here although certainly uh, computers and machine tools are high priority focused on telecommunications here although certainly uh, computers and machine tools are high priority items too. Well, how about the distinction between decontrolling the products but not the telecommunications technology? Is there a way to draw a line between actual hardware or software that could be transferred and the technology or learning that, that backs up those, those fine products? Well, the, there's uh, some places there is and some places there isn't. For instance, in the uh, uh, common channel signaling, which uh, was a part originally of the AT&T proposal for, uh, uh, for Poland. Uh, common channel uh, switching is a, a very sophisticated computer. It can be used for a lot of different things. And uh, whereas uh, we don't talk about the particular case because there'd be a lot of discussion back and forth, in general, that sort of thing is uh, like that is the sort of item that uh, the specific item as well as uh, some of the backup uh, software can can give uh, country a tremendous leap forward uh, into state of the art. Well, if AT&T has proposed common channel single signaling computers for Poland uh, is this a proposal AT&T has also made for other countries? I'm not familiar, Only for Poland. I'm not familiar with that if they have. The, the is the department prepared to see common channel signaling go forward for Poland uh, and or for other Eastern European countries? Before I answer this, let me, I, I know the answer, but let me, uh, mm -hmm. are we allowed to talk about it? <laughs> I didn't Not allowed so. to talk about not, that. I may <laughs> not answer, since it is pending, I, I can't answer I see. You, much as I'd like to. <laughs> well, is there a request pending to provide common channel signaling computers for uh, the People's Republic of China? Uh, not that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Apparently, it's my understanding from talking to committee counsel here that we already allow uh, common channel signaling equipment in, in China. That. Is that? Yeah, and actually it's a different mm -hmm. stage of it, I believe. I'm informed that we do allow apparently switching systems equipped with forms of common channel signaling such as PABX systems, but no ISDN Correct. restrictions. Yeah. Hmm. I have no further questions. Um, does the committee council seek other questions? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Mr. Ronaldo mentioned that the Communications Corporation for Eastern Europe 
which was recommended by the Eastern European Task Force. If you don't think that this corporation is such a good idea, uh, what other action would you recommend that we take? Well, we have taken uh, many actions, and, and uh, I can list some of them or give you some of them, although they're in my statement, I will. Uh, and I think we can take many more. For instance, we have uh, led uh, several missions to Eastern Europe of private sector companies, which are now in the process of either uh, discussing or bidding on uh, uh, many telecommunications areas. I'll just give you uh, just a quick list. It may only be partial, but the ones we're very familiar with because we've been talking with them. Is uh, besides the one I mentioned earlier, Bell Atlantic, Fidelity Communications, Hughes Network, Millicon, Motorola, Servcom, Teleconsult, U.S. Sprint, U.S. West, International, Control Data Corporation, Strategic Resources Corporation, and the Baker Companies. Uh, these are actually proposals that are made to Poland, to the to Polish waiting answers by the Polish uh, telecommunications body. Uh, so were these proposals cleared by the Commerce Department, or do they need to be cleared by the, your Commerce Department in this country? It's just pending Polish government action before they're approved? No, but uh, they uh, are ones that uh, at first blush look like they would have very little trouble being cleared. By us? Yeah, yeah. by the mm. commerce or by the U.S. government, yes. Well, that's an impressive list of firms. Your department in the various trips that have been made to Eastern Europe, I take it you've assessed the basic infrastructure needs of the various countries and have an idea of exactly what each country might might be most in need of so that we wouldn't just be relying on that country's assessment, we'd have our own independent idea of, of needs. Well, some of the uh, uh, areas that in the telecommunications, for instance, uh, besides the missions, which I mentioned in there, there are not only two missions which uh, uh, I led, but there were uh, uh, two others that were led by our uh, deputy uh, assistant or, or uh, assistant secretaries in this area. Uh, we've also, as I say, met with the Minister of Telecommunications. Uh, we've uh, had some uh, telecommunication missions to Czechoslovakia and Hungary um, with 12 companies along with us. And uh, we're doing so, uh, quite a bit of uh, training with NTIA of Commerce and uh, the USTTI, which is the uh, Telecommunications Training Institute. And uh, that's training in the U.S. We've already started with 60 Polish and Hungarian telecommunication engineers and managers. Uh, they're also studying uh, uh, at Mo Motorola in Illinois and uh, network planning at AT&T in, in New Jersey. Uh, and we see this program being expanded to the other countries, such as Romania and Czechoslovakia. Uh, we also have a team of 10 rural telephone company owners under the U.S. Telephone Association, which uh, will go to Poland the week of June 10th to provide seminars on rural telephone operations. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that the subcommittee or this Congress could do to help facilitate your efforts to... Uh, frankly, I think uh, the bills that have been passed uh, and uh, what the private sector in conjunction with our department and the State Department are doing uh, will move it. Uh, we do need additional uh, work on the, the other side. Uh, Poland has to pass a new telecommunications law and uh, the, as does uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and others. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So we, uh, in, in these cases, for instance, the companies I read off to you earlier, uh, these are proposals awaiting responses from Eastern Europe. And uh, uh, Does the NTIA and your department need to be strengthened so that they can uh, meet some of the challenges posed by uh, these developments? Well, you know, I, uh, everybody can always use more personnel and that costs money. But in, in truth, uh, we think our people, uh, although stretched a bit, are doing a good job and, are, and uh, have sufficient personnel to carry it on. Apparently, the Washington Post ran today a story on the 1991 foreign aid budget that listed nine nations slated to receive more than $300 million in foreign aid, while the total foreign aid budget for Eastern Europe is only $300 million. Do you think that this is an appropriate allocation or foreign aid mix given the developments in Eastern, Eastern Europe? Well, you know, I, uh, that's <laughs> something I can't answer. Not your turn. I, I do know I that understand. our foreign commercial right. service offices in each of these countries will be amply manned to do the job. And that, mm -hmm. uh, frankly, we did get an increase in our budget. That's the Commerce Department budget for uh, our commerce offices over in Eastern Europe, and that helped. Mm -hmm. and we thank you for that uh, additional aid. Seems to me there are two basic levels of assistance we're talking about. One is helping them buy fine American products and fine technologies. The other might be to help them restructure both the way state-run monopolies might be shifted over to the private sector and the way they could develop better frequency spectrum management and things like that. Are we also helping them on the broader issues so that they can develop uh, more flexible, uh, open, uh, for example, spectrum management policies and things of that sort? Oh, yes. We are, uh, and the, you know, telecommunications is, is a part of it, but we are, for instance, uh, our general counsel, uh, Wendell Wilkie, just came back uh, from a seminar uh, which he led in Poland of uh, lawyers over there to help them uh, understand how our business system of law works. And so that's a more generalized, but it, it's applicable in telecommunications as well as banking and other businesses. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, Congress passed and authorized last year $25 million for the so-called Polish American Enterprise Fund to be used for the, quote, early introduction of modern telephone systems and telecommunications technology in Poland. Can you tell the subcommittee just what is being done with this funding, if anything? Well, it is at this point uh, being put together. We have not applied it. I think it is actually under the uh, auspices of the State Department. We've been working with them. and. Uh, uh, just where it will be applied, I can't tell you yet because I, I don't believe they and we have not reached jointly or singly any decision as to where it would be best mm -hmm. applicable. Was your feeling that this is an appropriate level of funding or too much or too little? Or? Uh, well, I think for now it's appropriate. I, uh, if we find we have a specific place to uh, use more, uh, we'll, we'll be back with that. Remember, we also have the 245, 250 million enterprise fund. Two, somewhere close to that figure, changed a couple of times. So you which, have uh, we, can be used uh, in any number of ways, either for debt or equity and joint and, and uh, specific uh, deals in Poland. And we have one about half that size for Hungary, and we're working on, on how they can be best applied. So beyond Poland and Hungary, you would not anticipate the need for similar funds to be set up for other countries in Eastern Europe? I wouldn't say that there would not be a need, but at this point, uh, I, we don't have a specific place for them. Mm -hmm. Let me conclude my questioning, if it's all right, with this kind of general philosophical question. Some people have claimed to me that telecommunications equipment is inherently pro-democratic, whereas I think the version expressed maybe in earlier years by, for example, George Orwell's 1984 was that modern telecommunications was inherently undemocratic. Do you have a view on, on things like that? Is the spread of fax machines inherently going to help popular movements rise up and control governments? Or is the spread of Big Brother more likely as a result of all this? 
No, I think uh, telecommunications is uh, uh, a very important step in bringing these emerging democracies into the family of the West, and very important in, on many levels. I, I deal primarily with the, with the business and economic level. Uh, I think the other levels are important too, but in the, in the area that we have some expertise, it's almost essential to be able to make a telephone call. It's a simple thing that we take for granted, uh, both within these countries and from these countries to a, a partner or a customer in Western Europe or certainly in the United States. And at this point, they cannot do that. They have over two million people in Poland waiting for telephones. Waiting periods in all these countries vary from five to 13 years. Yes, it, it's essential. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my colleagues have questions, but my time has more than expired. Dr. Ritter, would you like to take the microphone? Thanks so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for your excellent testimony. I, uh, as the ranking Republican on the Helsinki Commission and as someone who is heavily involved in trying to boost high-tech America's ability to sell all over the world, I must say I, I have a, some, some mixed emotions as this thing goes forward. I don't worry that much about Eastern Europe. I really think irreversibility has come to Eastern Europe, although, as I said in my opening remarks, uh, Soviet troops still occupy Eastern Europe. My, my concern is more with the Soviet Union and the instabilities in the Soviet Union and the potential for reversible behavior on the part of the Soviet uh, leadership. And I, uh, I would be concerned, and I would like your opinions on the the uh, linking of uh, the 11 time zones across the length and breadth of the Soviet Union with a fiber optic, optic cable that people say will handle mostly traffic between Japan and the uh, and Western Europe, and and uh, how what kind of safeguards <coughs> are we uh, uh, going to seek so that such a new line of telecommunications is not abused by a nation which has for 70 years abused uh, telecommunications linkages. In other words, there will be traffic, there will be trunk lines, there, there will be uh, peripheral lines coming into the trunk line. Uh, who's going to have those lines? Is it going to be the KGB? Is it going to be the military? Is it going to allow better communications between uh, Soviet uh, military advisors in Central Asia who are running the war in Afghanistan and Moscow and the Politburo, or is it going to be people and businesses and firms? How do we know? Uh, what's, what, what, what are your comments on this kind of uh, Well, I, I share many of the same concerns. Uh, the Soviet Union is different in many respects from Eastern Europe. It's, it is less irreversible. <laughs> it is a potential military danger. And it has not agreed to let us uh, verify and, and oversee the tight uh, technology. So that uh, we have not uh, recommended allowing the uh, uh, higher technology, higher digital switching. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go into the Soviet Union. We feel very strongly about the differentiation uh, between the levels for Eastern Europe and that for the Soviet Union. Agree with you. And uh, we have uh, uh, found that in visiting with our COCOM allies, as opposed to uh, what has perhaps been uh, in some publications, that they have a higher level of, of interest in supporting us in this differentiation than, than uh, some might have been led to believe. And we feel that uh, uh, there's a good chance we can make this differentiation stick and keep this lower level given, in the Soviet given, Union. Given that uh, comment, I, some of us understand that uh, Cable and Wireless, a British company, is in hot pursuit of this contract to uh, lay fiber across the Soviet Union. Um, is the COCOM process uh, able to handle 
the, the flood of interested foreign competitors who could simply leave us in our policy dust? Well, that's why the COCOM process is so important, because uh, if we let someone else go ahead with it, uh, <clears throat> despite the fact that we're holding the line, uh, we haven't accomplished anything. What we've done is uh, negatively impacted sure. our, our own international competitiveness and our exports and everything we're trying to do for U.S. companies. So it's absolutely essential that we hold COCOM together, that we get the cooperation, and I think it's very important that we have this differentiation, and we're going to be working on it, and we have been. Uh, I, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm gonna ask Mr. Friedenberg yeah. uh, similar questions, but uh, again, I just want to return to part of my initial question, that is on safeguards. Um, are we going to seek any kind of safeguards of use or abuse of such a fiber optic line cutting across the Soviet Union? I mean, is the COCOM process, and that's the way it should work, it shouldn't just be us unilaterally. It should be all of us We're in the same boat. We've witnessed uh, COCOM contributing, I believe, mightily to decisions in the Kremlin to open up a little bit because uh, their own failure, economic failures, were not providing today's and tomorrow's technology. Are we going to look for safeguards? Man? Well, I can tell you we are, and I agree that it should be a full COCOM process. It shouldn't be just our doing it because, again, that uh, even if we do, do it by ourselves, it's uh, costly and, and uh, negatively impacts our competitiveness. So uh, that will be part of the discussions in, on June 7th, and, and that's where we've gotten some good early indications of uh, cooperation, and, I, and we'll push hard for it. I understand your time is tight. I have one last question, and that is, uh, we seem to have suffered in the global competition when it comes to investing long term, the 5, the 10, the 15, the 20 year project, it seems to me that part of the world, if things go in the right direction politically, is a real long term, long haul investment. Is our industry prepared to engage that kind of long term and patient capital to make the kind of inroads that uh, we can see the Japanese today are already talking about and starting to do in, the, in that part of the world? Or do, do, we, do we need, uh, once again, uh, capital gains reform that uh, allows <coughs> patient capital to be rewarded as opposed to eaten up by inflation over a decade? Um, like your thoughts on that? There's no doubt that uh, there are at least two aspects of this. One is that we do need to improve our cost of capital. One way of doing that is the capital gains tax reform, uh, the long-term savings, making R&D tax credit permanent, these other reforms that are so important, like product liability reforms, allowing joint production. These are things that we can do in the government to help lower the cost of capital and make people think longer term. And that is the second part of it, is, is the private sector, if we can get our cost of capital down and keep building our quality up, an area that you're very familiar with, that we can uh, make these companies, U.S. companies, in a position to think long term. The gentleman from Pennsylvania's time has expired. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Oxley, for a round of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you know, Mr. Secretary, a lot of people uh, advocate the carrot and stick approach in our uh, approach to uh, trading with the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. Um, and obviously, it's a very difficult call because on the one hand, if we liberalize COCOM and then uh, the Soviet behavior uh, uh, takes a step backward, uh, it's probably very difficult to put that toothpaste back in the tube. At the same time, if we're, if we're too strict uh, on our uh, trade policies, uh, we tend to lose out uh, to other competitors. As a matter of fact, there are some people who would say uh, that um, we may not necessarily have most of the carrots, if, all, if any of the carrots. I mean, that, that indeed, uh, if we were to take a strict uh, position um, in regard to COCOM, or too strict, 
uh, depending on one's definition, that um, other countries uh, would benefit uh, greatly, other, other competitor countries in their, pri in their private sector. Um, is that a real danger uh, that we face uh, that uh, w it's so many times our country puts ourselves in a position of, of uh, being uh, very uh, steadfast in our, uh, uh, in our attempts to uh, regulate uh, activities on, on the parts of other countries, and so many times that comes back to haunt us. Um, and I'm just wondering if, uh, if you have some concerns about that, D or do we have some carrots that nobody else has? And if indeed we do, um, what would they be? Well, I think uh, answering the last first, I think the carrot is that uh, in bids and other parts of the world, many parts of the world, including uh, uh, Western Europe, uh, we have the best telecommunications equipment and background and know-how capabilities at the uh, very, very competitive prices. So that, I think we do have a leg up in that. We have the best. Now, we have a balancing act between making sure that we keep our military security intact and not lose that and keeping COCOM together by easing enough so that uh, we are still keeping a cooperative attitude so what we've ended up doing is not just losing the bid for U.S. companies, but keeping everybody in COCOM together on not going ahead with the high technology into the Soviet Union at this point. It's not, a, there's no easy answer, but uh, we think with the changes the President has made uh, from 120 areas down to a little over, reducing it by a little over 40, 43 areas, taking them off the export license list, taking that into COCOM is going to put us in a good position to bring COCOM uh, together and uh, keep a wall around the strategically important items, which we're going to do with the new core list also. I would assume you're going to get an argument from some of our uh, next uh, panelists uh, specifically in that area, and I, I'm guessing they will disagree with, uh, with your uh, opinion on that in regard to what may or may not be uh, within the auspices of COCOM, what may or may not be critical in terms of potential military use and so forth. Uh, why don't, I know you have to leave, maybe this is a good chance for you to uh, get a, uh, a preemptive strike in at some of these uh, <laughs> folks and, uh, and leave uh, on a high note. Well, I <laughs> I think, first of all, we, we've, in an unprecedented way, within the administration, come together with defense, state, commerce, energy, and the other departments on what we believe is the right way to go, reducing the numbers, going after this to a core list of those things <coughs> strategically important. That's first. Second, I know we must be in the general right area because uh, there are a lot of companies and a lot of people saying we're not going nearly far enough, that we ought to liberalize it way beyond this. And then there are other people who say we're giving away our military uh, security now. Since we're in between these two groups, uh, I believe we've come down together in the administration. Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, Department of State, and the others in the right area after consultations unprecedentedly gotten together. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. Uh, I just want to be recognized for a, a couple of quick uh, questions. Um, you said, Mr. Secretary, that you don't believe that a communications uh, cooperation for Eastern Europe uh, is needed. Um, the question would then be posed, just really following up on the theme which Mr. Oxley uh, was uh, touching upon. The point would then be raised, well then, how do we deal with these issues of the need to uh, expand United States participation in these emerging markets in Eastern Europe on anything other than an ad hoc basis if we don't have some comprehensive uh, coordinating uh, mechanism which we construct which will ensure that on an expedited basis we are moving in to uh, exploit in the best sense of the word. Uh, the economic opportunities which are uh, now opening up. Um, how do we construct a dynamic which achieves that end and, and uh, doesn't uh, result with the um, 
the, uh, the Germans or the Japanese, the Koreans, the French, the British and others moving in, capturing these opportunities that after all, the United States paid the, the greatest price over the last 45 years in our defense budgets uh, in uh, now uh, creating uh, as an opportunity for our economies or for others to take advantage of. Well, Mr. Chairman, I agree with you totally on the goal. Uh, how we get there, we think if we do our job properly in commerce, uh, first of all, in the working with their export administration, the NTIA and ITA, you know, the, these areas, that we can get the job done working with state. We're, again, working very well with the State Department uh, through the AIDS and the, these other programs. We think we don't need to set up another entity. We think the private sector is going to be the final answer, and we can do it <coughs> by bringing, bringing them into us. All right, well, you see, that way. All right, then you suggested earlier that NTIA uh, might need additional resources, uh, personnel, uh, Well, I said uh, we're financing, but at this point, we're, we're getting the job done, and, and we may be back with, you know, to you with that. Well, what kind of additional resources would you think you might need in terms of... Uh, uh, congressional appropriations authorizations that could be targeted to this uh, particular economic opportunity for our country that commerce through NTIA might be particularly well suited and positioned to, uh, to, to help our American private sector to uh, capture? Well, we, we, you know, we proceeded on what we've got and we think we can do it, but what I'd like to do is get with the NTIA people and our budget people and, and review it and get back with you on that, okay. if I may. Because I, I'm, I think I'm fairly confident in, in speaking for our, our subcommittee and the Energy and Commerce Committee generally on a bipartisan basis that would like to be helpful uh, to the Commerce Department in terms of developing the capacity which can ensure that the government has the resources, your agency has the proper resources to be able to help broadly the American telecommunications but uh, high technology companies and others um, uh, uh, to uh, fully uh, capture the economic opportunities which are out there and any um, recommendations which you uh, make to us I think will be uh, very warmly received. Thank you Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you Mr. Chairman, uh, 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 Mr. Secretary. Um, Chair, will turn and recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Richardson. Mr. Ch Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, first of all, let me commend you of a number of initiatives that you're following. One, uh, the free trade agreement with Mexico. You have my full support on that. Uh, secondly, Mr. Secretary, uh, there's an issue that troubles me that I don't know if it's been raised in this hearing. But that is, uh, as you know, uh, U.S. West has been negotiating with the Soviet Union on a fiber optic uh, cable system. And my concern is this. What is holding this up in the U.S. bureaucracy? I think they're compelling foreign policy reasons. They're compelling uh, economic reasons for uh, job creation, uh, technology transfer. Uh, I had a meeting with the Soviet Minister of Communications. Uh, there's a strong uh, urge uh, in the Soviet Union to let our technology in rather than uh, someone else's. Uh, we are in a period of uh, perestroika and glasnost. I know things are a little shaky sometimes. But what is the problem? I mean, here we have a specific incident where we have some COCOM guidelines that are, that are outdated. Uh, we have a willingness in the part of the Soviet Union. We have an American company willing to make a substantial investment. I know there's some opposition in parts of the bureaucracy, but I, I'd like to know how you stand on this. Uh, is this a matter that is going to reach the president? Uh, is this something that might be imminent before the summit with <coughs> Mr. Gorbachev, a decision on this? And, and I'd like to kind of offer you that very broad platform to tell us uh, where this situation is and why we are delaying so much. If I, if I could interject at this point, uh, I would like to note to the gentleman from New Mexico that I've been notified that uh, Secretary Mosbacher does have a meeting down at the White House with the President at uh, 11. So what I'd like to do is to at this, uh, uh, invite the Secretary to answer the question, uh, but at the same time uh, do it in a, in a manner and in a time frame consistent with his uh, need to be down to the White House within uh, 12 to 14 minutes. So Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank we, you, we would yeah. like to accommodate both goals and at the same time be responsive well, to the gentleman from New Mexico. Uh, 
first of all, I'm not going to comment on the specific uh, 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 license or, or uh, uh, application because it is pending and we, I can tell you it is getting attention. That's the one thing I can tell you. But in general, what we're trying to do is balance the problem between military security, uh, uh, fiber optics across the Soviet Union and throughout the Soviet Union is extremely helpful to any military base. It's, it's very, very important as communications <coughs> are. We're going to have to uh, balance that between the very good points you made and our national military security, but we do also want to make sure we put in that equation that if someone else can do it and is going to do it, then our companies uh, get, in any case, a, a fair shot. So I'd be glad to call you and give you further answers if you'd like. I like that, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, and I apologize for... Thank you, Mr. Secretary. If, if you would, we w would, would like to do here is just to create an opportunity for our subcommittee members to submit to you in writing questions which uh, we have on this subject and ask for you to give us a timely response to those yes. in a written form. We thank you. We very thank much you, appreciate Jim. your thank participation. You. Thank you. Our, uh, our second panel um, consists of Mr. Mitchell Kurtzman, uh, President of Computer Solutions, who is uh, testifying as the Chairman of the American Electronics Association. Mr. Richard Pearl uh, here uh, from the American Enterprise Institute. He is a former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs during the Reagan administration. Uh, Mr. Edward J. Black, who is the Vice President uh, for in, uh, uh, and General Counsel for Computer and Communications uh, Industry Association. Mr. Paul Friedenberg here from Baker and uh, uh, Botts, a, uh, a law firm here in town, and a, uh, another former administration official. And Mr. Travis Marshall, who is the senior vice president and uh, uh, director of government affairs for Motorola uh, Incorporated. Um, this is a very distinguished uh, panel, and one which I think we're going to uh, uh, learn a lot from. Um, we're looking forward to their testimony. What we'd like to do is ask each of you to please keep your opening statements to five minutes. And uh, thereafter, during the question and answer period, you'll be given plenty of time to expand upon those uh, opening thoughts. So I would like to begin with you, Mr. Marshall. If we could, uh, please try again to keep your opening statement to five minutes. And then we'll move down the panel. Uh, in the order uh, that you are presently seated. So whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I am Travis Marshall, Senior Vice President and Director of Government Relations of Motorola. Could I ask you, Mr. Marshall, if you could please move that microphone in a little bit closer? All right. Is this better? Yes, please. All right, thank, thank you. you. I applaud you for focusing industry and government attention on telecommunications in Eastern Europe. As a member of the State Department Task Force on Telecommunications for Eastern Europe, and as the Chairman of the United States Delegation to the International Telecommunications Union <coughs> Conference last year, and as a member of the Board of Directors of USTTI, I am aware of the enormous opportunities and challenges that we face in promoting economic development in Eastern Europe. My testimony will reflect on first-hand information I received from my recent trip to uh, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, and the German Democratic Republic. Eastern Europe is again undergoing total political and economic change. I say again, they did it at the end of World War II and at the beginning of World War II, but we did not take much action each country is rapidly shedding communism and centrally planned economies while adopting democracy and market economies. Certainly, the United States should do all that it can to foster these changes. We must help them get to a point where they are no longer dependent upon the United USSR or the other Eastern Bloc countries. I expect to return to Eastern Europe later this month and again in July. 
one can actually see the changes take place because they are occurring so rapidly. Rules for private ownership of telecommunications were changed in one country while we were there. History is being made. You may recall seeing on television the Romanians taking down a huge statue of Lenin. We watched this very moving and symbolic event. You could feel the mood of the crowd as one more symbol of communism was being removed. The people of Eastern Europe are literate and educated and they are very pro the United States of America. They want democracy and Mr. they want market economy. Mr. Marshall, economy. could I ask once again, if you could just move the microphone maybe in a little bit closer. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. They want democracy and they want market economies. However, the change will be difficult. It will take years to fully accomplish and the displacement will cause pain and anguish for many. Although they are anxious to move to market economies, many of the managers are literally afraid of it. How can they assure new orders that will keep the business running? How can they ensure employment? In conversations with heads of telephone companies, I ask in each of the countries, if the United States private sector could do something for you, what would you want the most? The answer was surprising, but it was the same in all four countries. We need training in how to manage in a market economy. Of course, they also want United States investment and transfer of technology. Along with investment, they want exports to the hard currency countries so that they can import from those countries. The telecommunications infrastructure of Eastern Europe has been subjected to 50 years of neglect. Although dedicated technicians att attempt to keep in operation switches which date back to the 30s, parts are not available, nor is new technology. But while service and availability have slowly declined, demand has soared. The waiting time for a dial tone can be 10 to 15 minutes. The waiting time for a telephone can be 10 to 15 years. There are several reasons for this decline in telephone service. The communist governments were not anxious to have good communications amongst the citizens. Cash was drained from the telephone company to provide needs or support for other government needs. Hard currency was not available. And finally, of course, our export control rules were effective and the latest technology was not available. Mobile radio services, including cellular phones, radio paging, or radio dispatch, are not existent. They do not have them. This lack of telecommunications has deprived the economies of one of the most important tools of efficiency. One can say that there is a huge market. One can also say that there is a huge need. The market we have to help create. A country cannot become de a developed country without good te telecommunications. It is nece as necessary as roads. What can we do to assist improve telecommunications? Billions of dollars will be required each year for many years to update the telecommunication systems. This is far more than governments can or will give. But governments should help create an environment that will encourage private sector initiatives. The private sector can and I believe will provide the billions if the climate is right. First, government should pr prioritize its efforts including those of Exim Bank, AID, and OPIC, and perhaps even some of the many missions from state, commerce, etc. Second, a U.S. presence must be established. Third, the government should leverage its effort by working with the private sector. And fourth, we must make telecommunications a priority. The private sector will invest in Europe Eastern Europe telecommunications systems if the host country will allow foreign private ownership and if the rules and regulations are in place for the ver various telecom services. <coughs> this helps overcome one of the problems that Secretary Masbacher referred to. How do we get other countries to change their regulatory structure? I believe that government and industry can work as a team to accomplish this. The State Department, by the way, has actually started along this line. Government can also leverage its contribution by providing seed money 
or by contributing to those private systems that require a jump start. There will still be need for even greater AID contributions and XM bank loans. The United States should re-examine its AID and XM bank budgets. In these two areas, we provide far less than our major trading partners. And by the way, they consider telecommunications a priority. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Marshall. Um, second witness again, Mr. Richard Pearl, here from the American Enterprise Institute and the former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank the subcommittee for the invitation to appear. This is a momentous occasion. I actually heard the chairman uh, endorse a Republican administration policy, uh, but it turned out to be the policy of feckless temporizing with respect to Lithuania. So uh, it was bound to happen sooner or later. There's a lot of very interesting recombinant political DNA going on in this country right, right. now. And I, I think we're all in uncertain waters in terms of who our allies might be for the next 10 years politically. I, and economically. I look forward to seeing how this all evolves. <laughs> in, in the past, uh, as the chairman knows well, the sale of advanced technology that could strengthen the military capabilities of the Warsaw Pact has been subject to governmental restrictions imposed by the United States and its principal allies. And because of the central role of communications in organizing, commanding, and controlling military forces, these restrictions have included telecommunications systems and technologies. And because of the close association uh, between advanced telecommunications technology and microelectronic technology applicable to a wide range of military systems, guidance, fire control, uh, electronic warfare, and the like, there has been little Western involvement in the related generic industries in the countries of the Warsaw Pact, at least little legal involvement. For all its inadequacies, I believe that the control of exports for national security purposes has been the single most cost-effective program of national defense in the post-war period. It has slowed the acquisition of advanced Western technologies by the Soviet armed forces. It has enabled the United States and its NATO allies to maintain a balance of power with significantly fewer forces and weapons than our enemies have possessed. It has enabled us to supply our allies with weapons that are technologically superior to those supplied to their adversaries by the Soviet Union and its erstwhile Warsaw Pact allies. And finally, it has driven up the costs of empire and aggression, costs that President Gorbachev may now have decided the Soviet Union can no longer afford. By making it harder for the Soviets to achieve military preponderance, national security export controls have contributed significantly to the collapse of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe. And as our own defense budget declines, we will be handsomely repaid for the, uh, the modest costs of operating COCOM in the post-war period. National security export controls have always been intended to allow trade in non-strategic goods, while blocking the sale to our adversaries of goods and technologies that would strengthen their military capabilities, thus endangering us and our allies. I believe the purpose, the fundamental purpose of these controls remains valid, even as the people of Eastern Europe struggle to throw off communist regimes maintained in power we now know only by the forces of the Red Army, under which they've suffered through the post-war period. In my view, the changes taking place daily in Eastern Europe justify a liberalization in the sale of sensitive technology to non-military concerns in the emerging de democracies. That liberalization can and should be consistent with the still valid objective of blocking militarily sensitive technology from reaching the Soviet military machine. A machine, by the way, that continues to consume 25% or more of the Soviet gross national product. A dangerous and extravagant misuse of scarce resources that should be massively redeployed in the service of perestroika. In terms of the effort to replace a state-managed economy with a market economy, and totalitarian rule with free political institutions, Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia are in the vanguard. East Germany is a special case because it's rapidly being absorbed into West Germany. A relaxation in the COCOM embargo, particularly as it relates to telecommunications, is one measure that should be considered. And indeed, I think we ought to go forward with it. But there are two ways to do it. Um, one 
is consistent with our security interests and of potential benefit to the countries concerned. The other would damage our security and very possibly injure the cause of democracy in Eastern Europe as well. Let me explain these two approaches. The first approach which I favor would allow sensitive technology of a number of sorts, including telecommunication, to be sold to legitimate non-military concerns in Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and so on, so long as we were confident that the equipment, know-how, and technology would not be diverted to military uses or passed on to the Soviets or others. In this approach, we would grant export licenses after having satisfied ourselves that the buyer was legitimate and that once transferred, the licensed material would stay put. Gaining confidence that licensed technology uh, sold to one of the emerging democracies will stay there and be put to civilian use will require putting a control mechanism in place. I believe that can and should be done quickly and effectively. Under this approach, liberalization would proceed in general, but it would be applied case by case. This approach would allow legitimate advanced technology to go to countries who have for years until recently, and in some cases it actually continues, work closely with the KGB illegally to divert embargoed technology to the Soviet Union. Today, Soviet weapons are more effective against our own because of the work of Hungarian, Polish, Czech, and other East Bloc intelligence agents. We know that many of them remain in place, not because most Poles or Hungarians or Czechs wish to have them on the contrary but because, as we've been seeing, it's not so easy to get rid of them. One way to hasten their departure is to diminish their value. If we liberalize in a careless and irresponsible way, we will offer such treasures to the KGB clones in Warsaw, Budapest, and Prague that they'll never abandon their chosen profession and seek honest work. The second approach would be simply to raise significantly the level of technology that can be purchased by these countries without any safeguards. That may look easier than deciding case by case, but it entails a serious risk that they will wind up transshipment points for embargoed technology destined for the Soviet Union. And you may have seen in the papers just yesterday a, a case involving uh, a potential illegal diversion of a, of a um, supercomputer through Bulgaria. And uh, I have no doubt that it was intended uh, for the Soviet Union ultimately. <laughs> if we go about uh, uh, liberalization the second way we will be contributing, albeit unwittingly, to the corruption of the emerging market system in Eastern Europe. This, of course, raises the question of uh, where we draw the line. I see no reason why we should not become a supplier to Eastern Europe of modern telecommunication systems. However, there are two, are two areas where we ought to move carefully and with circumspection. One has to do with those advanced telecommunication systems that are beyond the capacity of our intelligence uh, organizations to penetrate. Particularly in the Soviet Union, which remains massively armed, it will continue to be important for our security that we obtain a stream of intelligence about military activities that must necessarily include military uh, communications. Certain transactions, the U.S. proposal to wire the Soviet Union with advanced fiber optic systems, for example, would deal a devastating blow to our intelligence gathering and should not be allowed. And I was struck that Mr. Richardson gave no evidence of even being aware of this issue in uh, his summary remarks that made it sound as though the case was 100 percent in favor of this, uh, this transaction. If the day comes when the Soviets stop spending a quarter of their GNP on the military and diminish greatly the strategic forces that continue to be aimed at us, we might consider whether we can then get along without knowing what they're doing. The second area where we ought to be cautious has to do with the transfer of manufacturing technologies and know-how for modern microelectronics that can be applied far more broadly than to civil telecommunication systems. Here I believe that we ought to continue restrictive policies, not least of all because these technologies cannot be usefully absorbed in the civil economy of the Soviet Union, but could and would be readily transferred to the Soviet military industrial establishment, the only part of the Soviet economy, by the way, that works effectively. In the case of these technologies for Eastern Europe, case-by-case -case licensing with safeguards uh, should certainly be considered. Without, I suspect, understanding what he was doing, Mr. Gorbachev has set in motion centrifugal forces that have reawakened old ethnic and national allegiances. In Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Moldavia, and elsewhere, there are hapless, restive people who have suffered under Soviet imperial domination. They see what is going on in Eastern Europe, 
They've seen the hammer and sickle torn from flags. They've seen statues and regimes toppled, tyrants shot or imprisoned. In a world of instant communications, the revolution in Eastern Europe is on display in the most distant corners of the Soviet Empire. In this sense, modern communications are fueling the demand for freedom deep in the Soviet Empire, just as the global flow of information figured crucially in the liberation of Eastern Europe. It is in the Western interest, in my view, and surely in the long-term interest of such Western values as democratic political institutions and individual liberty, that the global flow of information be as fulsome as possible. Modern systems of telecommunications have a significant contribution to make to the cause of freedom. But to make the most of the opportunity we, we now have before us, we must take care to see that our commercial activities lead to furthering communications and not military technology. That can best be done by intelligent relaxation of controls and not by their wholesale abolition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pearl, very much. Our next uh, witness, Mr. Mitchell uh, Kurtzman, is the president of Computer Solutions, and, but he is testifying here today as the chairman of the American Electronics Association. Um, but I would note that uh, uh, the company which he is the uh, chairman of is, the, uh, is in the 7th Congressional District of Massachusetts, and we're honored to have uh, the chairman of the American Electronics Association uh, come from uh, the best congressional district in the United States. So we welcome you, Mr. Kurtzman. Well, that's what we think too, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I want to commend you and the subcommittee for holding these hearings on such an important issue to our national security, foreign policy, and economic security interests. I also want to thank you for inviting me to appear with such a distinguished panel. Now, I have been warned about, uh, th there's been rumors of some panelists who have appeared with Mr. Pearl in the past uh, disappearing into some sort of uh, Bermuda Triangle of uh, export control policy. Uh, so I want you to uh, please tell my wife that I love her before I, <laughs> before I move on here. The dramatic political events unfolding in Eastern Europe have created an unprecedented opportunity for the American electronics industry to participate in the economic rebirth and restructuring of that region. Now the economies of these countries can only survive and prosper if their civil and commercial infrastructure is modernized along Western lines. Although industry is under no illusion that Eastern Europe will provide quick and easy profits, the long-term potential of that market really cannot be ignored. For the past half century, our policies toward Eastern Europe have been guided, and properly so, by the strategic threat of the Soviet Union. During the decades when the Soviets exercised their dominion over Eastern Europe, the overriding national security policy that drove the export control system was a policy of technology denial aimed at precluding the enhancement of military capabilities. During this era, it may have been reasonable to assume that technology in the hands of an Eastern European user was automatically available to the Soviet military. Now, with the political changes that have occurred and that continue to unfold, this assumption is no longer a reasonable one. The changed circumstances in Eastern Europe give the United States an important opportunity to pay more than lip service to a second critical national security interest, namely the fostering of American national security through maintenance of world-class technological competitiveness. A failure to recognize the entry of Eastern Europe into the global market would do much to undermine the security and foreign policy interests of the US and of our allies. Fundamentally, the assumptions that shaped our policies toward these nations have been challenged, and we must adapt to the new reality and act accordingly. Recent events have shown the importance of information technology in facilitating political and social change. And rather than fearing exports to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union of such technology as a potential threat to national security, the United States government should promote such exports as a means to further the democratization of previously closed countries. The free flow of information within those countries is an essential ingredient of economic and political reform. Additionally, such technology makes it increasingly difficult to reverse such democratic reform. Eastern European countries will not truly be integrated into Western markets if commonly used and internationally developed technologies cannot be used to fully link these networks into Western telecommunication systems. The American telecommunications industry is recognized around the world as the most efficient, economic, and the highest quality in the world. 
Consequently, we are in a unique position to assist these countries in modernizing their telecommunications infrastructure. Now, in the area of export controls, we are pleased that the administration has finally taken the first step toward these goals. The U.S. proposal does represent a significant shift for the administration. However, given the political, strategic, and commercial realities, these changes, we believe, fall drastically short. And while we applaud this shift and its direction, we cannot overemphasize that this must be viewed only as an important first step toward normal trade and that the U.S. must continue its liberalization. Now, the current American proposals in COCOM are at odds with even the modest needs of these countries. For example, under the administration's proposal, only local area networking, those with lines of less than one mile, are permitted. However, modern telecommunications require wide area networks and computers at three times the performance level of the current China Green Line. Such systems are common among small and medium-sized banks right here in Washington. Current U.S. proposals would prevent the national banking systems in Poland and Hungary from providing basic automated services like checking and savings. Now, over the next decade, Eastern Europe will spend roughly $30 billion to upgrade its telecommunications infrastructure. Our companies will face intense foreign competition to establish a toehold in these newly emerging markets. Our West European and Asian competitors are already aggressively pursuing these markets. Even if the major export control barriers are eased, trade with Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union will be impeded unless several other steps are taken in concert. These include waiver of Jackson Vanek, granting of most favored nation status, and authority for increased OPIC and international lending and finance. Now, in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I think we have a unique opportunity to support in a positive way, in an active way, the significant economic and political reform taking place in Eastern Europe. We must work together with our allies to ensure that these changes continue and that our national economic and security needs are not undermined in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kurtzman. Our next witness, Mr. Edward Black, once again, is uh, Vice President and uh, General Counsel for the Computer and Communications Industry Association. And we welcome you here today, Mr. Black. And whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, testimony to you on this very timely and important subject. Recent developments in Eastern Europe promise to bring greater democracy and prosperity to millions of people, as well as less fear and insecurity to the world. In support of these goals, we urge the adoption of policies which will help stabilize these new governments, encourage democracy, privatization, and capitalism, build up their civilian sectors, and increase their economic ties to the West. In order to achieve these goals, it is necessary to actively develop major infrastructure sectors, which are necessary to allow economic free market reforms to succeed. This will not be possible without the transfer of many products and technologies currently prohibited under U.S. and COCOM regulations. I will skip over some testimony because I think my colleagues from the private sector have so adequately explained both the importance of telecommunications, the products involved, and the other factors, financial matters as well, that n must be addressed before this problem can be completely uh, addressed in a, a reasonable way by U.S. policymakers. I would like to use this chance to go a little bit into some of the details of COCOM and the problems that we have in our export control policy. We have, over the 1980s, I'm afraid, witnessed a U.S. policy approach toward export controls, which has brought COCOM to the brink of disaster. Uh, we have lost credibility in the COCOM process, and I applaud the administration for its recent proposal as a first step uh, to restore some credibility into the U.S. position. The restrictions which we have placed over U.S. technology at the lower end under the export control system has cost, in the 80s, many tens of billions of dollars. When Mr. Pearl makes reference to the fact that this is a very cost-effective system, I suppose in budget dollar terminology of the number of personnel employed by the U.S. government, that may be true. But unfortunately, our system does not calculate the impact of, on competitiveness of U.S. companies lost sales and opportunities into those costs. And on that basis, the President's Council on Competitiveness, the National Academy of Sciences, and other studies have found that there is, in fact, a very major cost to U.S. industry and competitiveness. As we face a changing world, 
which is changing even faster than we've seen before, that competitive differential is potentially going to grow much, much more rapidly than it has before. Over the past decade, as export control policy has been focused, we have in industry seen an absence of the consideration of certain important facts which define the real world we live in, the growing globalization of business and trade, the diffusion of technology and technological skills to an increasing number of co countries, COCOM and non-COCOM countries. The increasing competition is at first class in many important areas. The rapid evolution of products and technology and therefore an increasing need to rapidly penetrate world markets, the changing military and commercial requirements of products, and physical obstacles to control. The miniaturization alone of technology has made the practical ability to control many things which we might wish, and even things we would all agree should be controlled. The practical ability to do so becomes increasingly difficult. Because major business decisions and commitments are difficult to make without some predictability and certainty, the case-by-case -case approach, which the administration has relied on to some extent in its proposal and is proposed by others as that which we must follow, is in fact not adequate to meet the needs of the modern international com competitive world that U.S. companies face. In fact, we do need the support and aggressive assistance and guidance of the U.S. government to define categories of products, of sectors for which licenses will not be required or for which a vastly changed licensing system can be put into place. There are statutory obstacles that exist to the flexible and responsive export control system. Fundamentally, the policymaking process is one of stalemate and deadlock. We have bureaucratic wrangling, and the Secretary uh, kindly described their consensus in his testimony as uh, yielding a, a reasonably positive result. We agree with that. It took a long time. And our view is that in the future, ongoing reforms will likewise be very slow to occur. And as I say, we live in a very rapidly changing world. We view that. Part of what not must be done for the telecommunications sector, because whatever solution is proposed, we will still have some ongoing control requirements. That part of the problem has to be to fix the system which makes the rules and which reviews licenses in this area. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Final witness is Mr. Paul Friedenberg, who is here uh, from the law firm of Baker and Botts, but uh, is. Uh, uh, area of expert, his uh, expertise was developed, uh, amongst other places, as an undersecretary for export administration in the Commerce Department uh, during his service in the Reagan administration. So we welcome you today, Mr. Friedenberg, and please begin whenever you feel comfortable. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be able to testify before the subcommittee today. Um, I would argue that uh, decontrol of civilian telecommunications would be the single most effective step the United States could take to support the development of market <coughs> economies in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Efficient telecommunications infrastructures are a critical prerequisite to the development of free market economies. As we proceed through the information age, communication systems define and limit modern economies on both the global and the national levels, economies that cannot exchange or acquire information rapidly, cannot participate in the global marketplace, nor can they develop internal markets capable of delivering goods and services to their citizens. Telecommunications also play a critical role in the development of modern democratic institutions. The hallmark of democratic nations is the free flow of information. A democratic society can only flourish when the citizens of a country control their ability to communicate among themselves and the rest of the world. For the government that represses its citizens, the telephone and the television are very subversive technologies. I know that came up as an issue earlier. Uh, I've come down very strongly on the 
uh, philosophical side of its uh, democratizing aspects. I'll summarize a good bit of my testimony since the uh, hour is late. Uh, the control is also necessary if the United States is to preserve its competitive advantage in the world telecommunications marketplace. Eastern Europe and the USSR will become significant markets for telecommunications products and technologies and related services. Our European allies actively seek these markets and competition there will be vigorous. Current export controls hinder U.S. firms in that competition. The controls generally apply to the higher end of the technological spectrum where the United States has traditionally enjoyed a competitive advantage. In addition, restrictive uh, uh, restrictions on tech data exports, which are enforced more stringently by the United States <coughs> than by our allies, further hamper U.S. companies in their efforts to supply services to civilian telecommunications authorities. The opportunity Eastern markets represent may be lost to the United States companies if the current export controls are not rela relaxed. The Europeans vigorously pursue business in these countries with the support of their governments. In contrast, U.S. export control procedures play the con uh, delay the uh, conclusion of business deals in these countries. Moreover, conditions placed on U.S. licenses often have the effect of changing the terms of a sale or contract. As a result, U.S. firms become unattractive business partners. They cannot deliver the necessary goods and services in a timely manner. In particular, restrictions on technical data exports may effectively bar U.S. firms from competing in these markets. The emerging market economies, in emerging market economies, Western companies typically gain access to the market by means of a joint venture with a domestic entity. Our current rules, however, were written with the objective of making joint ventures unattractive. Service providers may not perform such functions as drafting specifications, issuing requests for bids, evaluating bids, supervising installations, and fine-tuning a system to optimize its efficiency. Equipment suppliers, however, can provide such services. Thus, the regulations force U.S. firms out of an otherwise natural niche in the market. The control of telecommunications has been den denied largely on the grounds of national security. Specifically, the administration cites the danger of diversion to the Soviet Union as a reason for delaying the control. A sweeping embargo on transfers of telecommunications Technology, however, is an unnecessarily stringent means of denying the Soviet military from acquiring civilian telecommunications technology. Telecommunications systems cannot necessarily be diverted in the sense that other technologies can. A telephone switching station is not a computer that can be stashed in the trunk of a car and driven to Moscow. Even if physical diversion were possible, the presence of Western joint venture partners in a project would act as a safeguard against it. <clears throat> if the Soviets did obtain the telecom products, their proven inability to reverse engineer sophisticated microelectronics mitigates the security risk of diversion. For example, AT&T told me that they have more than 5 million lines of object code software in their 5 ESS system. Uh, to um, to work back from this to a new source code is virtually impossible. In addition, civilian telecommunications technology do not always lend themselves to military applications. For example, a mobile cellular phone system may, be appear, may appear to be ideal for battlefield use, but the standard civilian cellular phone cannot simply be plugged into a tank. The base station equipment and antennas must be port transportable and ruggedized. The mobile phones themselves must be ruggedized for combat conditions. The military significance of civilian cellular equipment, therefore, is much more <coughs> theoretical than practical. The same can be said for many other telecom technologies. For technologies that are more sensitive, specific safeguards such as on-site inspection can be established. Such safeguards will allow the U.S. to participate in emerging market economies without a high risk of diversion. I would suggest, I would also suggest that the development of those economies is as important to our national security 
as preventing the, Nash the Soviets from obtaining telecommunications technology. In the Soviet Union, the acquisition of a modern, efficient telecommunication system will do more to open society and to liberalize the political system than the continuing the hardline approach. I doubt, for example, whether a news blackout such as that imposed on Lithuania could have been successfully implemented in a country with universal phone service. In Eastern Europe, the transition to free markets and domestic, and, and, uh, domestic uh, economies will not occur without telecom modernization. Mr. Chairman, the United States has made a financial commitment to the development of, of emerging free market economies. Millions of dollars will be uh, spent on direct aid. Additional millions will be offered in the form of loans, guarantees, and insurance. These funds will be wasted, however, if the United States does not help these countries overcome the burden of obsolete telecommunication systems. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Friedenberg, very much. Uh, time for opening statements by um, the uh, panel has uh, ended. And now we'll turn to questions from the uh, subcommittee members. <coughs> We're going to begin first with uh, Mr. Ritter of uh, Pennsylvania, who is, uh, uh, I think, uh, prepared himself well for this panel. He has two degrees from MIT, a member of the Helsinki Commission, and the subcommittee on telecommunications. So I think he's got a pretty <laughs> and I, I want to commend you, Mr. Chairman. You did say that this was going to be a good panel, and it was. And the testimony, uh, not just the testimony, but the testimony for the record is a significant testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. I, I'd like to ask Mr. Black a question, just to kind of clear the air on this. Uh, you talked about COCOM restrictions having a high cost to U.S. industry and competitiveness. But I would ask you, what dollar value do you place on uh, glasnost, perestroika, change, change in the world, uh, sea change in the world, really to some extent brought about by American leadership and, uh, uh, and uh, things like COCOM, where we denied them. I mean, just on the matter of defense spending alone, where had they been able to uh, exceed what they stole and, and what they connived to, to get uh, from the West with uh, flat-out uh, acquisitions, I mean, wouldn't our defense budgets been a, a lot greater, and uh, wouldn't there be a lot less peace in the world or trend towards peace in the world today? Um, Mr. Redditor, I believe that while the claim is often made that export controls uh, were the cause or a very major cause. A contributing for, cause, I would say. And I think, I think how contributing becomes one of the factors and which part of the export control system. I don't think there's no one in industry. We, we are active supporters of an export control regime that focuses on a narrow band of important, truly critical technology. Unfortunately, and that's what statute apparently calls for. The difficulty is in the administration of that system. Mm. We have a system now which covers 40 to 50 percent of all U.S. manufactured exports. That's not a narrowly focused band. It is that the breadth of the system that has cost okay. greatly, I, and, and I would just suggest without the benefit. The benefit has come, I think, from the narrow band, not from the broad bottom band. I, mean, I, I would suggest that the benefit was the economic implosion of the USSR and Eastern Europe because the West refused to give them what they needed for a modern industrial technological society, and of course their military has to go, uh, has to somehow at some point feed off that which exists in the rest of the economy. Um, I uh, would like to ask uh, Mr. Pearl about uh, whether or not it's possible to define, instead of going to everything on a case-by-case -case basis, is it possible to define some technologies right off the bat in your mind that, uh, for example, things like faxes, PCs, consumer electronics, things that are very definitely individualized, uh, spread around over large uh, numbers of people, uh, if you look at uh, what the various movements inside East Europe and Soviet Union have done, I mean, uh, computers and fax machines have been marvels in helping. And are there, are there other elements systemically which can't necessarily be abused or over, uh, used against us by, by military and intelligence agencies, KGB and like in the Soviet no, Union? Uh, uh, good question. Uh, not only would I not uh, license fax machines, uh, 
but it, I think it's very much in our interest and in the interest of democratization that there be widespread availability of fax machines, uh, PCs, and the like in the, uh, in, in the okay. Eastern Bloc, including the Soviet Union. Uh, and I think we can liberalize significantly by decontrol as distinct from requiring licenses. But at the high end of the spectrum, case-by-case uh, -case treatment seems to me the, the only reasonably safe way of uh, assuring against uh, diversion. And I have in mind here less telecommunications yeah. because, uh, as Paul Friedenberg observes, frequently the equipment there is fixed and uh, could not be uh, readily diverted. But uh, What was that? I'm sorry. Said, frequently telecommunications equipment is in a fixed location and could not be readily diverted. Uh, but that is not true of some other uh, electronics uh, related technologies. I've looked at the administration's uh, proposed uh, delisting or removal of categories, and it strikes me that there's some extraordinarily high-tech and uh, uh, dual-use systems in particular that uh, could be readily uh, used by, by the Soviet military. Well, you want to comment on that? Yes. I, I, it's a confidential document, and therefore I, I won't mention anything by name, but there's some of the elements uh, don't uh, there's, there's no seem question. divorced from military uh, use. And uh, it's, it's rather more pronounced outside the telecommunications area. For example, the proposals that we now mm -hmm. are taking around to COCOM with respect to machine tools will decontrol machine tools that have no useful role, at least in the short term, uh, in the civil economy of the Soviet Union. They couldn't absorb them. Their military economy, by contrast, can. And More the, advanced automated I'm talking about three, three, mac, three micron machine tools, for example, very precise machine tools. Mm -hmm. um, the irony of moving in this direction is that it, uh, it will be the, uh, the death blow to the American machine tool industry in Eastern Europe. And we, we are, in effect, by this decontrol, handing the market to the Germans, the Japanese, the Swiss, to some degree. Uh, to countries that, uh, uh, that make uh, machine tools in that range uh, where our own industry has proved to be, uh, be inadequate. And we're going to lose market share, uh, potential market share, in the Soviet Union as a result of this decontrol. So the, the notion that American uh, competitiveness is always um, restricted by, uh, by the controls is simply wrong. We actually benefited from the controls on machine tools, although that's not Mm -hmm. the reason why we have them in place. But in that area in particular, I think the administration's proposals are quite reckless, and we will be transferring uh, massive numbers of machine tools, mostly from Europe and Japan, directly into the Soviet military sector. There are no distinctions in this decontrol scheme with respect to machine tools between military users and non-military users. Interesting, uh, and I might add, in addition to just machine tools on this list, are a whole host of items which uh, have, I mean, even to a lay person like myself on military technology, I mean, it's obvious that uh, the, the uses are quite uh, potentially dual. Mr. Friedenberg, you talked about if you decontrol uh, telecommunications uh, trade with East Europe and the USSR, you kind of lumped the two together there, and that bothered me a little bit. I know you've worked a lot on the, uh, the trans-USSR uh, fiber optic cable line. And I just wondered, do you envision any kind of uh, safeguards against the abuse of such a system by, say, the KGB and the military who would have the most immediate access to using such a facility, uh, and again, would have the most, as Mr. Pearl, I think, stated, that they would also have the most technological know-how to go into business first, so to speak. Um, is there any way that uh, COCOM and the process, and us and the Japanese and the Germans and the rest of the Europeans can, can uh, be engaged in, in some kind of oversight so that there isn't uh, KGB and, and, uh, and Soviet military abuse of such a system? Well, there are, uh, Soviets have agreed to safeguards. Uh, I've given advice in that area on safeguards, particularly since that's what I handled when I was at the Commerce Department. They've agreed to safeguards on the uh, project. Uh, they've publicly stated that they'd allow on-site inspections. Um, 
they said that in an April article in the Financial Times. Uh, what kind of safeguards are we talking about? What kind of on-site inspections? Well, those would be negotiated, but you'd have uh, uh, essentially free access by uh, Western inspectors to, uh, to, the, to the line, to the switches, to, ev to all parts of, of the line. Uh, there would be only equipment going, not, not design. We're not talking about giving the Soviets uh, the manufacturing capability, and I think that's a very important difference. You could have inventory controls, very strict inventory controls, and the maintenance done essentially with U.S. technicians, uh, and you would have uh, no, no hardening features. And one has to recognize they do have a very elaborate, in our own Defense Department states in their recent annual report, Soviets do have an, a very elaborate uh, military, ruggedized, hardened telecommunication system for their own military. They essentially know, uh, as Mr. Pearl has been talking about, uh, that there, is, uh, there are attempts to monitor public communications. They're not, uh, that's one area they're very good in. Uh, so they're not going to be linking these things up to uh, missile sites and be uh, communicating uh, the um, uh, military information on this type of line. So essentially what you're talking about is a telecommunications, uh, civilian telecommunications system with safeguards. And again, the question would be, can we stop other uh, countries from, from uh, going ahead with this project? Thank you very much. I'd like to just interject here and let Mr. Pearl, I, I, saw, his, you know, I'm shot, I'm, I, I saw him reacting negatively to the suggestion which the, uh, the uh, on-site uh, safeguards that is, Americans or international teams monitoring the activities of the Soviets in these areas where telecommunications technologies had been transferred into that country uh, would be adequate or desirable. Can, can you just deal with that question? So we can yes, Mr. Chair, I think it's preposterous, the notion that uh, if the Soviet Union were wired with, uh, uh, with uh, fiber optic uh, systems that uh, there is any kind of meaningful safeguard or surveillance that uh, could prevent the kind of use uh, that uh, Congressman Ritter was talking about. Obviously, uh, the communications intelligence on which we depend now to a significant degree uh, would be lost to us if the Soviets had systems that we can't penetrate, and we cannot penetrate these fiber optic systems. So in the first instance, uh, there would be a, a massive loss no matter how many inspectors you had, but it's... Uh, it, it's hard even to imagine what it is that they would be in inspecting. Uh, the KGB would make uh, uh, free use of the system of communications, as would uh, the Soviet military and military industrial complex. The fact that it would not be uh, usable as a wartime uh, military command and control system uh, doesn't mean that it doesn't have a lot of other uh, military and intelligence applications that should trouble us. Um. I'm going to return to this. I'm going to recognize the gentleman from uh, Tennessee first, but uh, I think that we have to have a, a more expanded discussion in this whole area because it seems to me that if thousands of Americans, let us say, could be in the Soviet Union for a decade building a system, that that in and of itself would give us a, a substantial uh, intelligence gathering uh, capacity and that uh, in view of the fact that the Soviets would then be dependent upon us for the maintenance of the system which we built, after all, in the first place, uh, that that cannot be completely dismissed as an opportunity uh, for intelligence uh, gathering over uh, the coming generation, as opposed to if the Japanese or the West Germans or others uh, build the system. So I think it's a, a counterbalancing uh, 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 I'm certainly not recommending that we deny ourselves an opportunity that is available to other countries. This has to, any policy with respect to um, a uh, nationwide fiber optic system in the Soviet Union would have to be uh, to work an agreed upon COCOM wide policy. I, I just would hate for us to lose the lead role in something that uh, could be of enormous benefit economically to American companies uh, if a consensus develops to move ahead of us and then we wind up playing the catch up. Uh, position so that we lose both the economic and potentially the, uh, the intelligence and military benefits that would have flowed more directly to our country rather than to others. Um, so at this point, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I don't want to shock Mr. Pearl too much or you, Mr. Chairman, but I find myself in deep uh, sympathetic agreement with Mr. Pearl's testimony. The 90s are going to be very interesting. <laughs> and we, we, we uh, are not denying that. Uh -huh. I feel that Mr. Pearl is basically saying that while the Soviet threat uh, uh, may have diminished, it hasn't disappeared, and we should be very careful about what we do. I also wonder uh, if the panelists would care to comment about other threats which I think our nation faces. For example, the terrorist threat, which is primarily, as I understand it, a media-supported uh, crime. You know, if you couldn't get on worldwide television to, in a sense, hold the world hostage when you do these various things, you would have much less of an impact. Uh, I realize that it's very hard to control these sorts of things, but it's one of the, in a sense, crimes or outrages of the modern telecommunications age, and it's one that I haven't heard anyone talk about today. The drug lords have uh, begun using terrorist methods as a way to promote their goals, and yet we're all sitting here silent talking about the Cold War and the vestiges of the Cold War and ways that you know, telecommunications may or may not support uh, democratic movements in, in Cold War era countries. I'd like to get the panelists' response to see if there's anything that we could do in a telecommunication sense to minimize the impact that terrorists have on the world when they um, undertake one of their terrorist activities. Should we begin with you, Mr. Marshall? Or? Um, really, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Cooper, to answer that question on what might um, telecommunications do to um, uh, stop terrorism, uh, I'd, I'd like to give that a little more thought and try to give you a more concise answer uh, if I can. Um, Is maybe one of the other panelists might have a better or more specific answer to that. If I could comment mm -hmm. on it, I think you're talking about a political, not a technological solution. There's nothing technologically one can do to stop a terrorist from getting control of the airways. There is something you can do politically by cooperation. But you also may have repression involved in that, which is inimical to our uh, system. And so you have a real dilemma. You have the classic dilemma of the modern age. There's nothing that you technologically do other than having some worldwide person with his <coughs> finger on the button that stops these people from getting control of, uh, the, of the airwaves or the attention of the press. But to me, it seems to be a very interesting statement that we should give up there's absolutely nothing technologically that we can do to limit or impede, uh, in a sense, a media-supported, technologically-based outrage of, of our generation. And it, the only solution is political. You may be completely right, and I'm not disputing that. But it's interesting to me, the impotence of our technology against a terrible outrage are the rest of the panelists also willing to give up and say there is nothing whatsoever that we can do technologically to stop or limit or impede some of these things that are going on? Should we just give up? I think up I have to con largely concur with Mr. Friedenberg. Um, I think you have a political problem. I think mm -hmm. there are solutions. They are diplomatic and they are political. They are, they are out there, but um, frankly, one of the things in export controls and we've always found a problem is a use of an attempt to use economic sanctions to solve fundamentally political problems. I don't think there's a technological solution to this one that, that presents itself. Let me rephrase it. If the Hezbollah wanted to be a big customer of yours, would you have any qualms about selling them the latest in video equipment so that we could get a good accurate picture of the hostages that are being held? I would have some, some qualms sure. about that. I mean, I, I uh, uh, to some extent, there's, there's a commercial perspective on life, which says there's, there's several aspects of it. One is, for example, is I sell software to manufacturing companies, and if they do not, do not agree to buy a support agreement and a relationship along with the software, I won't sell them my software because they're not going to make productive use of it. They're not going to be a good customer. I don't see why you can't apply the same thing to sales in, in anywhere in the world. Uh, that's the issue that, that relates to the, the fiber optic issue. The same thing, I think, with uh, uh, we, choo we choose our markets in the commercial world. I would feel perfectly good at not selling anything to the Hezbollah. I would, I would feel happy not selling food to the Hezbollah. Uh, 
But I, I <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you feel that way. In my limited eight years here in Congress, I have discovered very little uh, willingness on the part of some businesses to uh, uphold standards. Peer group pressure seems to be the rule. And if anyone anywhere on earth can get the sale, most folks I talk to want to get the sale first. And I have seen companies do extraordinary things, including selling, for example, supersonic wind tunnels to South Africa, wind tunnels that only have military uses without losing a night's sleep over it. You know, because another country or another company was threatening to get there first. And I'm glad that you have scruples, but I'm worried that a number of our businessmen won't lose a night's sleep over providing a fiber optic cable system to the Soviet Union, despite Mr. Pearl's concerns. And you know, maybe communism is dead. I hope so. Maybe these threats we don't need to worry about. Maybe it is impossible technologically to fix or improve any of these situations. But isn't it interesting that we're prepared to give up at the outset, or largely give up, and just say, oh, it's a political problem. Let the folks in Washington worry about it. Meanwhile, we merrily go ahead and stop thinking about possible solutions and possible fixes. I'm more optimistic, I think, than some of you gentlemen are. I think that technology can fix or improve a number of problems, even in unanticipated ways. And we shouldn't give up from the start. I, I can't imagine that anybody uh, on the commercial side of this panel is saying that, that we are unwilling to work to find ways to apply technology in that way. My gosh, that would be, that would be wonderful. Uh, it doesn't stop me, however, from giving you a professionally skeptical opinion that, that I'm not aware of the technology to do that. Would, would I uh, cooperate with the government in, uh, if, let's say, DARPA wanted to fund the uh, development of this technology? We, sure, we might be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Subsidy is the recurrent theme in most of these discussions. Um, let's, let's take it step by step. You have scruples about selling to a particular client. Do you have scruples about selling to a particular type of user? Oh, sure. I, uh, I think that, for instance, you look at this, I'll give you an example in our own country. You look at a struggle that, for instance, the, uh, the, the long distance telecommunications suppliers have with uh, abuse of their 900 services and things like that to, uh, for dial-up porn, et cetera. There's a case where there's a very valuable technology, a very valuable service, and you see, I believe, uh, the companies like AT&T, MCI, and others having genuine uh, problems with They do not want to carry that uh, unless basically forced by free speech they have to. So I'd say this, this track record that corporations do have some, some conscience and scruples about the use to which their technology is applied. I think you're omitting 9X from your uh, list of companies that have sought very hard to restrict the use of the service because it's a very profitable service well, in the New York area. As I understand. Ninex, in fact, I'm, I'm a Ninex customer in New England, and Ninex has probably taken more steps that I'm aware of to uh, make those services inaccessible to the public network. So I would think I would urge you to compare job. Bell South's efforts in this regard. I'm not familiar with them, mm -hmm. but I, I'm familiar with Ninex. I'm somewhat familiar with the issue, and okay. the discrepancy in treatment by the RBOX, the Bell operating companies, was remarkable. Uh, Bell South, as I understand it, took the leadership role in the nation to restrict or limit services. Other RBOCs were remarkably slow, and there's almost an even correlation between profitability of offering of services and the slowness with which the enterprises met the, met the challenge. But that's a side, side issue. It's just, me, capitalism should and does have a moral component, and I'm just worried sometimes many of the exponents of capitalism fail to see that component. Uh, not to indulge too much in old Cold War rhetoric, but I think it was Khrushchev. I'm sure Mr. Pearl remembers this far better than I. Didn't he say something, or maybe it was Lenin, who said that capitalists would sell the very rope by which they would hang capitalists. We need not necessarily to forget that argument, even though communism may be dying, but to remember that they might be buying the rope by which they could hang our own hostages or hold the world's attention. And surely there's something we can do about it. I see that my time is expiring. Thank you, Chairman. Gentleman, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of Ohio, Mr. Oxley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pearl, a few weeks ago, you testified before uh, Senator Nunn's committee uh, regarding particularly the uh, need or lack of need to modernize our uh, ICBM capability uh, in light of the changes that have occurred in the Soviet Union. Um, it received a great deal of uh, press attention because of your former 
position uh, with the Reagan administration and perhaps, at least from the press accounts, indicated a rather uh, abrupt change of uh, attitude uh, on your part as it related to the Soviet Union. Um, and that was, uh, again, widely reported. I wonder how you would square that with your remarks uh, to the committee uh, that uh, say, and I, and I quote, that liberalization can and should be consistent with a still valid objective of blocking military sensitive technology from, from reaching the Soviet military machine. A machine, by the way, that continues to consume 25% or so of the Soviet GNP, a dangerous and extravagant misuse of scarce resources that should be massively redeployed in the service of perestroika. Um, I, I have too much respect for you to, to accuse you of being inconsistent, but I do wonder if there is uh, some, uh, something I'm missing here uh, in the last uh, several weeks that may have changed your attitude uh, towards the Soviets, uh, and particularly as it related to uh, your former statements. No, I think what's missing was reliable reporting of my earlier testimony. Well, that's not surprising. In, in the press. Um, I did uh, attempt to deal rather specifically with the question of whether we should proceed with the uh, midget man uh, mobile ICBM program and whether we should proceed with the uh, MX program. Uh, but the thrust of, and I, I could repeat the position I took on those issues if you're interested, but the thrust of my testimony was first to make the observation that the collapse of the Warsaw Pact uh, as a cohesive, integrated uh, military force had greatly diminished uh, at least one of the threats that we have planned against in the post-war period, which was a massive invasion of Western Europe by the coordinated forces of the Soviet Union and its allies. That threat, it seemed to me, was diminished, uh, and we, it, it made sense to recognize that fact. Uh, the second threat that I thought was diminished uh, as a result of changes taking place in the Soviet Union and elsewhere is a massive, out of the blue, uh, surprise strategic nuclear attack by the Soviet Union on the United States. Now, I was very careful to say that uh, it had not been eliminated, it had simply been diminished. And uh, I had some recommendations on how the defense budget should be adjusted. Uh, I recommended spending more money in some areas, like uh, SDI, and less money in, uh, in other areas, uh, including less money for uh, the modernization of the land-based portion of the uh, strategic missile force because it seemed to me uh, that the investment on the order of $60 billion in Midget Man uh, was a misplaced uh, in investment. But uh, that testimony was anything but uh, a, a shift philosophically from the position I've held all along, which is that it is vital to our security that we maintain an effective deterrent against uh, of the Soviet Union, which remains very powerfully armed. You know, since Gorbachev came to power uh, in 1985, the Soviet Union has added to its then existing superior conventional forces more tanks and artillery tubes than currently exist in the combined armies of Britain, France, and West Germany. It's a staggering, continuing buildup of military forces, despite the rhetoric and despite the hopes we have that uh, we're going to see a downturn. And one of the reasons why I feel rather strongly about maintaining uh, the controls on advanced technology is that I don't want to breathe new life into the Soviet military establishment by giving them now something they've not had during the post-war period, uh, which was relatively unencumbered access to those technologies that would enable them to use that continuing investment far more effectively. And I think what we're doing with respect to machine tools, for example, will have exactly that effect. Uh, machine tools will pour into the Soviet military industries. So that uh, from that standpoint, you would, you made the point, and I think I quote you correctly, as talking about legitimate non-military sources uh, where, where the uh, trade could take place. Um, how would you define that? Uh, and how could we, in fact, uh, guarantee that uh, those uh, particular items would not end up in the, in the hands of the military as in the machine tool example? Well, with, obviously with certain machine tools, it, uh, it would be difficult or even impossible to, uh, to maintain control once they were transferred, which is one of the problems with the decontrol that we're now embarking upon in the machine tool area. We are decontrolling up to a, a, a very high level. 
And once that decontrol takes place, there will be no legal inhibition, uh, not only on selling machine tools that are today embargoed to the Soviet Union, but installing them in Soviet military plants. Now there may be, a, as an act of conscience, there may be the occasional manufacturer that chooses not to do that. Uh, but there will be no regulation against it, no law against it. Um, and it'll happen. There's no doubt in my mind it will happen. With respect to some machine tools, uh, very large installations, for example, if we wanted to differentiate between civil facilities and military facilities, in principle, uh, we could do that, uh, provided we could monitor that the continuing presence of a particular piece of equipment in the place to which it was sold. Uh, I have a view about how we might uh, implement the existing controls more effectively, uh, and that is to privatize the function of monitoring the continuing uh, adherence to conditions and, and uh, rules and regulations. So for example, uh, if one wished to sell uh, components of a, um, of a modern uh, banking system uh, to Hungary. Uh, let's say uh, some very large supercomputers used to manage uh, um, a, a, a network. Um, in order to assure that, that that system remained where it was supposed to be, uh, we might enable private firms like auditing firms to file regular reports. That, um, that seems to me far more effective than pretending that the U.S. government has the capacity to, uh, to verify the continuing compliance with regulations because we really don't have that capacity. Well, what if those reports were filed and they, uh, they indicated that uh, it was being diverted uh, to military use? So what? what do we do then? I mean, the cat's out of the bag at that point, is it not? Well, you would, there would be quite a lot at stake for the for a variety of participants in that diversion scheme, for the original purchaser, for the government involved, for the, the companies that had entered into the transaction. Uh, you mean there, our there, our there are no 100% guarantees, that's, uh, that's for sure. You mean our, uh, there, were, there would be sanctions against our, country, our uh, companies? Well, there would be, there would be sanctions against the, the, the purchasing entity. If, if for example, a, uh, a a sophisticated computer sold for civil purposes to a business in, in Czechoslovakia were diverted to the Soviet Union. Um, I would assume that we would be reluctant to make further sales to that entity and we might even um, put further restrictions on sales to, uh, to Czechoslovakia. What, what I'm suggesting is that uh, if we are going to have continuing controls, we'd better think about how we're going to monitor them. If we are going to differentiate, as uh, Secretary Mosbacher said we should, between the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, we had better think about how we verify that things sold to Eastern Europe stay in Eastern Europe. And we haven't uh, put in place an arrangement yet. I think privatization of that is, uh, is the only way to get a, a, an effective and quick uh, capability. And I've been urging it uh, on the Department of Commerce uh, without much success, I, I might say. And I would hope the Congress would take a look at that because it seems to me that if we could have confidence that sensitive technology sold in Eastern Europe would stay in Eastern Europe. Uh, we could go further in making uh, advanced equipment available to Eastern Europe with, with confidence. Let me, if I could, just one last question, Mr. Chairman, because I had mentioned a carrot and stick approach in my opening remarks. And one of the things that I'd like to hear from the panel, uh, just very briefly if you would, um, in what areas are we so superior uh, as a supplier in telecommunications specifically, uh, that we are indeed the only uh, supplier of that particular product. And isn't it a fact that in almost every case, uh, somebody, either the Germans or the Japanese or somebody else, has an equivalent product uh, that uh, is another carrot, that we have the same carrot, and doesn't that diminish our ability to leverage those or to use those in any real way uh, to, um, to keep uh, those kinds of technologies from getting into the wrong hands. Mr. Marshall? Well, <clears throat> certainly I would start off by saying my company's products are superior. We understand that. All and, right. Uh, now, however, we'll, we'll uh, stipulate to that. Uh, the foreign competition does have an equivalent product. We are, we are way ahead of them in the miniaturization of cellular 
telephone subscriber equipment. But um, the gap in other parts of it is uh, very, very brief. I mean, it's a very small gap. I, I do not see in the field we're in a tremendous uh, lead. Now, until, unless you get into other products such as microprocessors, which gets us out of the telecommunications field. But wouldn't the uh, Eastern Europeans, for example, instead of buying, I mean, they could buy brand X then, in other words. I mean, well, they wouldn't necessarily get the quality Motorola. They'd get brand X, but somehow they'd muddle through. It depends uh, on how effective COCOM is. I understand. If, that's, if what, that really, that's what if this... If we are restricted from selling a product to Eastern Europe, then um, certainly the other members of COCOM should have the same restriction. I believe that was your point, was it not? That uh, we are not doing much of anything if we, uh, if our uh, fellow members of COCOM ship and we don't. I understand. Mr. Kirschman? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I believe uh, I, I would agree with, uh, with Travis on this. I, I'd say that you're coming to the heart of, of our ability to continue as a leader in COCOM and to get the cooperation of our allies, which is fundamentally if our position in, in a competitive technology like telecommunications, uh, if our position on restrictions just doesn't make economic sense, if we can't sell that, then COCOM's going to fall apart. Uh, so to that extent, I think that a process of, of negotiation with our, uh, with our COCOM partners is going to produce uh, the, the correct solution if we're willing to listen to them. I believe that the, with what's, go, what's going on in Eastern Europe, particularly with our European partners, we will simply not be able to hold COCOM together unless we take a reasonable approach. Well, it, it, for, precisely, I remember uh, Diana Lady Dugan, and, and when I quoted her when I, in my opening remarks is, the, Ger the German, West Germans are everywhere. Uh, and I, I suspect you probably uh, feel the same way. Well, what my, my sense is that uh, that America, the United States, can be most effective if it limits its restrictions to uh, a smaller number of items and absolutely holds firm on those uh, that make sense, rather than to, to take a broader approach to this. It can provide leadership as opposed to what looks like just uh, uh, protectionism, virtually. These are you two gentlemen. Uh, two quick points on it. Number one, we are, it's axiomatic, we are most competitive at the high end, which is what I said in my testimony. And therefore, if we restrict ourselves through COCOM to the low end, we're going to be less competitive. It, it follows. Second point is we have said no in two very large cases in China. Our allies then took the deal and convinced the president in both cases that we ought to, after the case, approve their sale. That is, COCOM didn't break down because we agreed ultimately. But in an uh, intercity fiber optic line and in a uh, large switching uh, manufacturing system, we, in both cases we said no. And in those, both of those cases, the British and the Belgians took the business and we got simply no national security benefit out of it. So in that I agree with Mr. Pearl. If we're not going to hold it together, there is certainly is no point. But I think we can if we have reasonable proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentleman's uh, time has expired, and uh, chair will recognize himself. And uh, what I'd like to do is just lay a little bit of uh, of, <coughs> of a, of a uh, context in which my questions are going to be posed, um, and I will do so just by giving a little bit of background, a little bit of history as to how we got to this point. Um, the administration has proposed a limited relaxation of COCOM controls on telecommunications technologies. Um, and I think all of the members of this panel are uh, in agreement with, those re with that relaxation. Mr. Pearl? Um, Congress is about to consider relaxation on the floor of the House as early as next week, which would decontrol most civilian telecommunications products for uh, export. And there we have a range of opinions which exist on this panel with regard to the appropriateness of that. And each would perhaps draw the line at a different point. Mr. Pearl most likely at where it is right now as the administration uh, has made its <coughs> proposal and that others somewhere deeper into uh, more sophisticated uh, telecommunications <coughs> technologies. Um, the uh, question then comes on which technologies 
we want to see uh, transferred. So it seems to me that one, on plain old telephone services, uh, with regard to transfer into the Eastern European community, there's no problem. With regard to personal computers, there seems to be no problem, no debate. With regard to cellular phones, again, there seems to be no debate. Now we move more deeply into this telecommunications transfer. Uh, we move down to microwave or radio communications to packet switches and digital switches that would bring the Eastern European network up to post-World War II uh, technology. Uh, we reach common channel switching that would allow for quicker um, uh, rotating of calls and allow for more sophisticated uh, business services like 800 numbers and credit card uh, calling. And we reach as well, mainframe computers and sophisticated workstations. Now, those final four areas that I mentioned are in contention for Eastern Europe uh, and as well for the Soviet Union. The most dramatic example is the U.S. West uh, case, which is the proposed uh, uh, fiber optic cable deal with the uh, Soviet Union, which, as Mr. Pearl has commented from his perspective, would deal a devastating blow to our intelligence gathering. And Mr. Pearl further describes it as a military communication system, quote, which is beyond our capacity to penetrate. Um, my perception has been that the proposed fiber optic uh, line it was designed to provide civilian long distance service um, to some parts of the Soviet Union and to establish a business da data link between Europe and Japan, uh, which does not sound on its face like a military communication system. Um, so I have some problems in understanding why it would be objected to and what I'd like to do uh, is to just pose a few questions then so that we can then have a, a discussion with regard to what is or is not a security um, <clears throat> a problem for the United States. Given the fact that the speed at which a fiber optic system operates is irrelevant to our ability to intercept communications transmitted over it, and the Soviets uh, will receive uh, 45 uh, megabit uh, capacity, China getting 140 megabit capacity, and Eastern Europe 156 megabit uh, capacity. Um, why is there an objection then to the transfer of the advanced fiber optic system? Where is the distinction that is made in terms of that technology transfer? Mr. Pearl? Well, my objection uh, Mr. Chairman, broadly speaking, as to the notion that uh, we uh, should go into the Soviet Union uh, and make a massive investment in rapidly installing for them a system of communications that we are not capable of intercepting to replace one that we can. Um, now, if you believe it's important to monitor Soviet communications, uh, then obviously you don't want to do something that's going to deprive you of that continuing capacity, and that is precisely what installing a uh, fiber optics communication system would do. And the sophistication of the, of the system itself is less important than the fact that it's beyond uh, our reach, unlike uh, microwave communications and radio communications and so forth, which we can intercept. I understand. Now, don't they have already, Mr. Pearl, a separate military communication system which they built in their country? They do indeed. And doesn't it make sense that in the same way that if, for example, we had contracted with the Soviets to build our civilian communication system, that we wouldn't be putting sensitive military data over that, and that similar, and, and we do have our own military, our own defense communication system in our country that uh, is used for the transmittal of very sensitive 
uh, military, national security information. Does it not make sense that in view of the fact that they already have a secure uh, national security and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and defense system in their country for telecommunications that they would rely upon that while still trying to capture the benefits, especially that is the benefits of a fiber optic system, especially if the Americans had built it? Uh, would they not uh, have uh, 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 some reservation about then using it for that purpose? And to the extent to which they do use it now, it seems to me it would have to be for a very small percentage of their information since they've built this other system anyway. I, 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 th I think there's a limit to how far we can carry on this conversation in an, in an open hearing. Um, but I think it's fair to observe that the director of the National Security Agency and the intelligence community by and large has unanimously and with unaccustomed vigor uh, opposed this transaction. Uh, and they do so because it is their conviction that uh, with this system in place there would be a significant decline in the availability to U.S. intelligence of the sorts of information upon which we depend to make important intelligence judgments. It is not simply a question of military communications. But I don't want to get any further into it uh, in, in open session. And I, in any case, I'm not the right person to interrogate on the details. I, I would urge you to hear from the, uh, the people who are responsible for gathering the intelligence on which we make judgments about Soviet military capabilities. I did ask, by the way, the uh, National Security Agency to come in and give me the briefing, uh, uh, the, the uh, top secret briefing on the levels of information which we receive uh, from their communication, their public communication system as opposed to their um, uh, military system. And I might point, I might say that I, I am not convinced or persuaded that they are correct. And that is that the benefits aren't overwhelmingly on the side of building uh, with American companies a fiber optic system for yeah. commercial civilian use throughout their country. Uh, to what uh, incremental benefit comes to us from the present well, monitoring capacity? I have my of. doubts about this large American uh, American presence. I don't I don't know what numbers or sorts of people you have in in mind. Uh, I do think that uh, I other things being equal, it would be in our interest for the Soviets to communicate by microwave uh, uh, in a manner that would uh, facilitate our uh, understanding what they're doing. I, I don't deny that it would be uh, beneficial, and in fact, if we can open up that spectrum even more across the world for uh, uh, civilian use, we might have uh, everybody using cellular phones over, uh, within, 20, uh, within 20 years. But um, the, um, the balance here is, um, it seems to me, going to be struck by what the West Germans and what others decide to do, and to the extent to which we lay back and believe that uh, uh, Minister Schwartz Schilling's uh, uh, commute into Moscow on a regular basis to help negotiate these contracts is going to be foreclosed by our hesitancy to, um, to uh, make these deals, I think is uh, not reflective of the real world pressures that exist in Europe for them to move in and to capture these economic opportunities. Well, I, I, I uh, do not believe that we can now conclude that uh, those of our allies capable of doing the deal that U.S. West has in mind uh, would do so uh, over our objections uh, worked out within COCOM. COCOM, it, it's always possible for a COCOM member to say we are no longer going to play by the rules and on this transaction uh, we're going to depart from the rules and we will break the rule of consensus. But uh, the way COCOM operates, has operated up until now, a consensus is, uh, is required uh, to grant an exception to the rules, which would be required in this case. And if the United States were to exercise its right of veto, it would require a, a fundamental breakdown of the COCOM regulations for a member to go ahead with that transaction. But this should be the subject of discussion and negotiation with the, within the community of COCOM nations. I 100% I, I And if we could all agree that uh, we're all prepared to provide microwave communications to the Soviet Union, let them modernize on a basis that, uh, that's useful for the Western world having a, uh, having a view of what's going on inside that place that for centuries has been pretty opaque and where 
some confident knowledge of how things are evolving is terribly important to managing the relationship. Um, if we could achieve that result, it would be a good result in my view. U.S. West could put in a microwave line instead of a fiber optic line. Mr. Kurtzman? Well, I, I believe that we have, we have a, in this country a remarkable uh, black and white view of our uh, friends and adversaries. Uh, I would say that we view Japan and our government views Japan totally as a friend and despite any evidence, strong evidence I believe that they are uh, targeting us in ways that are not military but economic, we continue to resist uh, looking at the possibility that we might need to take action to protect ourselves. On the other side, we view uh, the Soviet Union uh, only, as a, only as an enemy and despite any evidence that they might have any commercial intentions, we refuse to acknowledge that that might be the case. I believe, in fact, that the world is becoming uh, less black and white, that in our, in our world, in our industry, uh, once co people that were once competitors are now becoming customers and partners, and, and that's happening economically and it's happening politically. I believe almost every country and bloc in the world is both a competitor and a customer and a partner, and we must develop the ability to view them in such a way and to make uh, judgments that are, that are rather than black and white that are more gray in nature. And uh, I, I would look at this in this context. Uh, Mr. Friedenberg. I think you, you, you hit on it in your analysis, which is the, the trade-off between having the United States uh, and other Western companies, but mainly U U.S. companies, in the middle of their telecommunications system, not only for this project, but for other projects that will follow. Um, uh, they already are opening up, uh, for example, the Moscow phone system to let AT&T put an overlay in and uh, other sorts of projects uh, versus uh, saying no in that case, losing the intelligence that we were talking about, uh, I mean, gaining the intelligence we were talking about, but having, I think, the political pressure for others to take this project, not maybe this year, but uh, in a very few years, plus the Soviet capability of building something like this uh, within a few years. The question would be how long and what the trade-off of that period we delay them would be. The second point is that they can, they, we can stop this project. If things turn sour, we can stop this project. And if things get really sour, uh, there are ways to uh, be disruptive. Uh, so I don't think we're, we're talking about us. And the Soviets know that. They're taking a very big risk by having the Americans in there. It's a very important uh, step on their part. Okay, Mr. Black. <coughs> Yes, to, the, to stress that what we're talking about here is an intelligence issue, uh, the basic export control system that we operate under is focused on products and, and technology being utilized by the military to give a military advantage. So we're already, many people view this as outside the scope of the actual law as a legitimate consideration. But, but given the fact that, that it, it has entered it in such a major way, the uh, intelligence gathering capability uh, I, I think the hardwire example of their, of their control system is really the core issue. There will not be that widespread uh, utilization of this system for really sensitive uh, uh, purposes, we don't believe. The differential treatment in COCOM that actually takes place should also be alerted. I, I think it's very clear that there may be an initial decision uh, to deny the U.S. West decision if that were to happen. And what we would have is what we've had many times before is another COCOM nation go comes to its government, gets approval, then comes back to the U.S. government. So you have a situation where the U.S. government is not being approached by a U.S. company, but by a foreign nation urging to please reconsider our position on the fiber optic system. And we wind up ultimately making the same decision but we make it in a time frame which has cut the U.S. company out of the deal. Uh, you won't have simultaneously a differential decision being made, but you have it in a time sequence where we tend to lose. Can you help us yes, with that? It would just be sheer incompetence on the part of the U.S. government if it were to say no to U.S. West and turn around and say yes to, uh, uh, to a foreign competitor. And I, while I'm always, while I'm seldom surprised when I see incompetence, I don't assume it. And uh, with all of the attention that this case has gotten, I. Uh, I'm inclined to assume that we will do something coherent and carefully worked out with our allies. With our allies. But on the other hand, what if the scenario which Mr. Black lays out does come to pass? That is that we 
basically um, surrender the time lead which we have right now in the, this high-end technology area as the other countries in the world now move quickly, uh, that is over the next couple of years, to narrow that gap. Uh, and then we are faced with the inexorable pressure of a concerted uh, effort by all of our COCOM allies to now move further. But now, rather than having a lead, we're now placed basically on a level playing field, uh, technologically. This is an argument for uh, essentially abandoning the controls any time you think you have uh, an opportunity to make a sale that, that goes beyond them. If you no, apply it broadly, uh, in every area where we have a lead, you could argue that we should sell now because that lead uh, may be a wasting asset. In fact, uh, in, uh, I don't know where you would draw the line if you were to uh, argue on that basis. I think Paul Friedenberg has just offered a profound argument for why the Soviets should not buy from us. Uh, he said if things go sour, we can uh, uh, disrupt the deal or even sabotage it, is the implication. Well, uh, I mean, that's probably right. Wouldn't you want to be in that position uh, with the pro Soviets? Probably Mr. right, but uh, my guess is that uh, uh, other countries, the competitors that he's worried about, would not be so quick to uh, turn off a deal even if things went sour. If we were the so lead, why shouldn't they we were do the business lead, with them? If we were the lead nation and the lead company, and basically were the, uh, the uh, partner that had brought the others into the deal in a more limited form, wouldn't we be in a much better position than to control what but happened? The, the argument is if we don't do it, it'll be cable and wireless or someone like that. Now, if, if you were in Moscow, you might reasonably ask yourself, uh, do you want to put this lever in the hands of the Americans who are known to be capricious and irrational and they change their view all the time and there's a lot of ethnic politics and you never know what they're going to do from one day to the next, but you can count on the French. They're craven and commercial at, at their very core. Well, they and speak very no highly of you as well, Mr. <laughs> no matter how the, how the world changes, you can count on the French not to, uh, uh, not to disadvantage uh, French industry for the sake of a principle, so buy from the French. I, and I understand the unique French personality, but it, it seems to me that you, here what we're talking about is not something which is limited to those which have... Um, basically thumb their nose at uh, a collective strategy which was constructed over the last 45 years. Rather, what we see is the United States more and more uh, facing the prospect that we'll be the skunk at the garden party and that uh, the uh, rest of our allies during the Cold War uh, will have adopted uh, a, a completely different approach that we can almost predict that uh, almost inexorably uh, will be reached uh, over the next couple of years. And I guess my, my concern is that it seems to me in politics that you, you want to start out uh, as much as possible where you're going to be forced to wind up anyway. Uh, because the other prospect is one where it looks like we're fighting history, that we're not... Uh, uh, capturing kind of the the uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the changes which are taking place, and that we hurt ourselves at the same time, and that's really what my problem is here. You are saying that we shouldn't do it because others are going to do it, but on the other hand, if everyone else is going to do it, if we can fairly well predict that this is where it's all heading, <coughs> and as long as there are safeguards, as long as there are limitations placed upon it, then it seems to me that we've we've not gained anything, but really lost opportunity. But I, I'm not a at all sure that that's where it's, uh, where it's headed. And in, in recognizing the changes that are taking place, uh, it's important to recognize that the process of democratization and certainly the process of demilitarization uh, has gone and will go much further in places like Poland and uh, Hungary and Czechoslovakia than has so far happened in the Soviet Union. I, I think we want to encourage the Soviets to, uh, to take steps that are now only being talked about. And uh, one can only be disappointed at uh, what we've seen in recent weeks. Gorbachev's decision not to press ahead with the economic reforms that might have meant uh, uh, rapid movement toward a free market economy with all of the political connotations that entails. Uh, the aggregation in his hands of uh, powers not seen in the hands of a Soviet leader uh, since the Tsars, and perhaps uh, even exceeding the Tsars. Uh, the strangulation of Lithuania after we were told that, that these tactics would not be used. I can't tell you, and I don't think you can tell me, 
uh, what the Soviet Union is going to look like uh, two years from now uh, or even six months from now. Uh, so a bit of caution before we, uh, we devote ourselves to uh, putting in place a system that will blind us to a significant degree uh, seems to me in order and we ought to be able to work out in concert with our allies a common approach. Now if that means that two or three years from now, because democratization uh, in the Soviet Union has moved and we're more comfortable, if it means that we have lost a bit of a, a competitive technological edge at that point because somebody else is caught up, that doesn't seem to me an unreasonable uh, price to pay uh, in order to protect against the, uh, the downside. Okay. Now, if we can't get our allies to agree, then you've got an entirely different situation. I, I, I concur in that. So, my time is expiring. My, my point is this, that I agree with you that there are many technologies, certain supercomputers, other technologies, which have direct military application, which we should deny to the Soviets. On the other hand, and I think this is a fundamental difference of opinion which exists, many believe that traditional telecommunications technologies that uh, are now in a more modern form would actually help in democratization, would help no, in, for that. in converting I'm, I'm their economy exception. over. And we're having really a debate here over, it seems to me, over timing and not a, a, a fact. No, no, but no. I, I'm all for the Soviets having modern telecommunications. Uh, I think that would probably help democratization. But let them do it with a technology that we can read. It's, I, just, it's just as simple as that. I said, my time has expired. The uh, chair recognizes the gentleman Thank from you. New York, Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Uh, Pursuing this point, uh, Mr. Pearl, uh, is there logical justification for us to have a sort of a differentiated policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Warsaw Pact, as you characterize them, and uh, the Soviet Union? I, too, am concerned at the, the conundrum of what it means that Mr. Gorbachev continues to talk about perestroika and glasnost, but in expenditures on their military, there seems to be little or no identifiable reduction in the order of magnitude of investments in military. There may be a slight change from an offensive posture to a defensive posture, but according to the CIA and other people who've testified uh, before the Joint Economic Committee on which I serve, there is not a demonstrable reduction in the level of military expenditures, and as you pointed out in your testimony, they're still, still spending this <coughs> unbelievable level of 25% of GNP or thereabouts at a time when their economy is collapsing, at a time when their economy is in a free-fall depression, according to Soviet experts who testified only two weeks ago before our committee, at a time when the prospect of widespread famine is a reality out there at a time when street demonstrations in cities across the Soviet Union are a likelihood by consumers who don't have the barest necessities uh, to buy in the stores. Uh, why Mr. Gorbachev continues this policy, I don't know. But it's, it's a puzzlement to me. Uh, on the other hand, you talk about the military capabilities of the Warsaw Pact. Advanced technologies, you say, could strengthen the military capabilities of the Warsaw Pact. Is that phrase an oxymoron? Does the, does the Warsaw Pact exist as a military No, reality? I don't think it does. And if, if I use that phrase, it's, yes, you did, uh, and it you, must have been in the word processor from, it's in uh, the, uh, <laughs> from last year. Yeah, it says, in the past, the sale of advanced technologies that could strengthen the military capabilities of the Warsaw Pact uh, uh, in the past, the emphasis in that sentence uh, okay. uh, is, is... Is there a Warsaw Pact no. with military capacities as a reality no. out there? happily, uh, the, 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 the Doesn't most... Doesn't that mean, then, that we can have a, a far different policy vis-a-vis -vis the countries of Eastern and Central Europe? And you should say cent Central Europe, in addition to Eastern yeah. Europe, as President Havel uh, pointed out to me, because Prague, he said very proudly, is west of Vienna, Congressman. Uh, shouldn't we have a differentiated policy yes. then? Okay. By all means. I'm, I'm very much in favor of a differentiated policy. In some important respects, uh, we are moving to an undifferentiated policy, uh, which will have the effect of transferring direct to the Soviet military uh, technology that I would happily make available to Eastern Europe, but I think shouldn't go into the plants that are turning out the tanks and the APCs and all the rest. 
So I totally I'm, I'm very much in favor of a differentiated. Policy. I totally agree with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. No way I can miss it. Yes, I've been asked to close the hearing. The, hear the hearing is hereby adjourned at the call of the chair. <laughs> There's an important roll call vote going on now that we all must rush in. Join us Friday morning just before 5.30 a.m. Eastern Time for the comments of William Diefendorfer. He's the Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget. And he'll be speaking about the federal budget deficit and ways to reduce it in a speech delivered on Thursday before members and guests at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Coming up next here on C-SPAN, a news conference held on Thursday by West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. This week on Communications Today, 1990 Pulitzer Prize reporters Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wu Dunn, both from the New York Times Beijing Bureau, speak about...